The Hunt for Red October by Tom Clancy Read by Richard Crenna The first day, Friday 3 December, the Red October. Captain First Rank Mark Aramius of the Soviet Navy was dressed for the Arctic conditions, normal to the Northern Fleet submarine base at Polyarnii. A dirty harbor tug pushed his submarine's bow around to the north, facing down the channel. Engines ahead slow, come out of, he ordered. The tug slid out of the way, and the Red October, a Typhoon-class sub, moved under her own power toward the main ship channel of the Kola Fjord. Increase speed to one-third, Ramius said. Captain Lieutenant Kamarov, the ship's navigator, repeated his captain's order over the bridge telephone. So, my captain, again we go to sea to serve and protect the Rodina. Captain Second Rank, Ivan Ureyevich Putin, poked his head through the hatch, without permission as usual, and clambered up the ladder with the awkwardness of a landsman. Indeed, Ivan, Ramius replied with more good cheer than he felt. For the hundredth time, Ramius told himself that Putin was the perfect political officer. His voice was always too loud, his humor too affected. Putin was an easy man to fear. Ramius surveyed the fjord through his binoculars. At noon, the sun was barely over the southeast horizon, casting orange light and purple shadows along the rocky walls. Why is it, comrade captain, that you always seem glad to leave the Rodin and go to sea? Ramius smiled behind his binoculars. A seaman has one country, Ivan Yureyevich, but two wives. Now I go to my other wife, the cold, heartless one that owns my soul. Ramius paused, his smile vanished. My only wife now. Putin was quiet for once, Marco noted. He had been there, had cried real tears as the coffin of polished pine rolled into the cremation chamber. For Putin, the death of Natalia Bogdanova Ramius had been a cause of grief. For Ramius, it had been an unnecessary, monstrous crime, one that demanded punishment. Captain, message from fleet headquarters. Read it. Exercise area clear. Proceed as per orders. Acknowledged, Ramius said. The speaker clicked off. Putin clapped Ramius' shoulder. I told the men political administration Red October's in the best of hands. Ramius smiled grimly at that. <laughs> you son of a bitch, the captain thought, saying in front of my men that you must pass on my fitness to command. A man who could not command a rubber raft on a calm day. A pity you will not live to eat those words, comrade political officer. Ramius looked aft at the bluffs of the Kola Fjord. How many times in his twenty years of service had he looked at the wide, flat U-shape? This would be the last. One way or another, he'd never go back. He had left a letter in the last mailbag taken off before sailing. There was no going back after that. Ramius made one last careful scan of the horizon. The sun was barely visible aft, the sky leaden, the sea black except for the splash of whitecaps. He wondered if he were saying goodbye to the world. He dropped down into the control room. All systems are live. We are rigged for dive, the navigator said crisply. Dive, Ramius ordered. Vents at the top of the ballast tanks were opened, and water chased the buoyed air out. Level off at 100 meters, Ramius watched his crewman. The first dive could make experienced men shudder, and half his crew were farm boys straight from training camp. The hull popped and creaked under the pressure of the surrounding water. A few of the younger men went pale but stood rigidly upright. Five minutes later, the submarine slowed a descent at 90 meters and settled to a perfect stop at 100. Ramius turned to leave the control room, motioning Putin to follow him. And so it began. Ramius and Putin went aft to the submarine's wardroom. The captain held the door open for the political officer, then closed and locked it behind himself. Putin poured tea as the captain checked his watch. Fifteen minutes until they could open the safe. Two more weeks of confinement, Putin said, stirring his tea. The Americans do this for two months, Ivan. Of course, their submarines are far more comfortable. Despite her huge bulk, the October's crew accommodations would have shamed a gulag jailer. The crew consisted of 15 officers housed in fairly decent cabins aft and 100 enlisted men whose bunks were stuffed into corners and racks throughout the bow. You want to cruise for two months? Putin asked. No. A submarine belongs at sea, Ivan. But any period over two weeks and the crew becomes a mob of numbed robots. Ramius was counting on that. 
And we could solve this by having capitalist luxuries, Putin sneered. Comrade political officer, that which aids us in carrying out our mission is good, that which hinders us is bad. Just being aboard a submarine is hardship enough, is it not? <laughs> that is true enough, Putin agreed. Both men knew exactly why Soviet missile submarines spent so little of their time at sea, and it had nothing to do with creature comforts. Missile submarines were by definition beyond any control from land. Their entire mission was to disappear. The crew of such vessels had to be trusted, and so they sailed less often than their western counterparts, and when they did, it was with a political officer aboard to pass approval on every action. The chronometer chimed four bells. Romeo stood at the safe and dialed in his three-element combination. Poutine did the same, and the captain opened the safe's circular door. Romeus removed a manila envelope. He broke the wax seal and extracted the four-page operation order. He read it quickly. It was not complicated. Poutine finished his cigarette and his tea before standing. He turned towards the door. I think... Romeus kicked Poutine's feet out from under him just as he was stepping away from the table. Poutine fell backwards while Romeus sprang to his feet and grasped the political officer's head in his strong fisherman's hands. The captain drove his neck downward to the sharp metal-edged corner of the wardroom table. It struck the point. With a sickening crackle of bones, Ivan Poutine's neck broke. His spine severed at the level of the second cervical vertebrae. A perfect hangman's fracture. Poutine's mouth flapped open and shut without a sound except for the exhalation of his last lungful of air. His eyes went up to Romulus wide in shock. There was no pain and no emotion but surprise. His face flashed with recognition, then darkened. It was nearly two minutes before the heart stopped completely. Romulus took the teapot from the table and poured two cups worth on the deck, careful to drip some on the man's shoes. Next, he lifted the body to the wardroom table and threw open the door. Dr. Petrov to the wardroom at once! Petrov was there in seconds. He slipped on the deck when I spilled my tea. Romulus gasped, performing heart massage on Putin's chest. I tried to keep him from falling, but he hit his head on the table. Petrov shoved the captain aside, tore the shirt open, then checked Putin's eyes. Both pupils were wide and fixed. The doctor felt around the man's head, his hands working down toward the neck. They stopped there, probing. The doctor shook his head slowly. Comrade Putin is dead. His neck is broken. He closed Putin's eyes. No, no, he was alive only a minute ago. The commanding officer was sobbing. It's my fault. I tried to catch him, but I failed. My fault. He collapsed into a chair, and he buried his face in his hands. My fault. Petrov placed his hand on the captain's shoulder. It was an accident, comrade captain. These things happened. It was not your fault. Truly, comrade. Will this be reported to fleet headquarters? No, no, we cannot. Our orders are to maintain strict radio silence. Romeo handed the doctor a set of operations orders from his pocket, not those taken from the safe. Page three, comrade doctor. Petrov's eyes went wide, reading the operational directive. I would prefer to report this, but our orders are explicit. No transmissions of any kind, for any reason. Petrov handed the papers back. Yes, comrade, orders are orders. The second day, Saturday, 4 December, the Red October. As was the custom in the Soviet Navy, Ramius posted the orders the day after sailing and gave his crew a pep talk. Comrades, he began into the microphone, this is the captain speaking. We have orders from the Red Banner Northern Fleet High Command to make the ultimate test of our new silent propulsion system, to pass all of the imperialist solar nets without being detected. We will teach the Americans a lesson about Soviet technology that they will not soon forget. Our orders are to skirt the American coast to challenge and defeat their newest and best hunter submarines. We will proceed all the way to our socialist brothers in Cuba. If we succeed in reaching Cuba undetected by the imperialists, and we will, the officers and men of Red October will have a week, a week of shore leave to visit the beautiful island of Cuba. Romulus looked up from his prepared speech. The men on watch in the control room were exchanging grins. It was not often that a Soviet sailor was allowed to visit another country. And for Russians, Cuba was a promised land of white sand beaches and dusky girls. Now for the bad news. This mission will not be an easy one. We must maintain absolute radio silence and our operating routines must be perfect. You young comrades new to the sea, learn your duties well and carry them out exactly. There are no small jobs on this ship, no small responsibilities. Do your duty, follow your orders, and when we have completed this voyage, you will be true Soviet sailors. That is all. Comrade Captain said Captain Second Rank Vasily Borodin, who had the watch. Shall we engage the caterpillar? Proceed, Comrade. 
Engines all stop, Barodin ordered. All stop. The dull rumble of the engines died away. Barodin picked up the phone for engineering. Comrade Chief Engineer, prepare to engage the Caterpillar. Caterpillar was a nickname for the new silent drive system. Ready, Comrade Borodin, the Chief Engineer reported back in a moment. Open doors fore and aft, Borodin ordered next. Doors open, Comrade. Engage Caterpillar. Build speed slowly to 13 knots. Build slowly to 1-3 knots, Comrade, the Engineer acknowledged. The hull now had a new sound. The engine noises were lower and very different from what they had been. The reactor plant noises, mainly from pumps that circulated the cooling water, were almost imperceptible. The Caterpillar did not use a great deal of power for what it did. Caterpillar functioning normally, Comrade Captain, Borodin reported. Excellent, Ramius replied. The VK Konovalov The Soviet submarine VK Konovalov was drifting back and forth, waiting for the Red October to arrive for the beginning of exercise October Frost. Captain Second Rank Viktor Alexeyevich Tupolev paced slowly around the control room of his small, fast attack sub. He had served with Ramius, the schoolmaster, for two good years, and while he found his former commander to be something of a cynic, especially about the party, he would unhesitatingly testify to Ramius's skill and craftiness. And the Red October had the caterpillar. It would be a bastard to detect. Tupolev planned to mimic the American tactic of drifting slowly, with just enough speed to maintain steerage, perfectly quiet, and waiting for the Red October to cross his path. No attack submarine commander had ever embarrassed Ramius. He was determined to be the first. The third day, Sunday, 5 December, the Red October. Ramius entered the control room in mid-morning. Lieutenant Ivanov, he said to the junior officer of the watch, I will be calling a meeting of the senior officers in the ward room. You will now be the officer of the watch. Any questions? No, Comrade Captain. Ivanov was standing at rigid attention. Good. Ramius smiled and walked briskly to the wardroom to join his waiting brother officers. Each officer in this room was a member of his conspiracy. All were single. No one had left behind a wife or children. All were party members in good standing, and each one shared with his comrades a deep-seated dissatisfaction with, in some cases a hatred of, the Soviet government. The planning had begun soon after the death of Ramius's wife, Natalia, when his rage had burst forth with a violence and passion that he had struggled to contain. A lifetime of self-control had enabled him to conceal it, and a lifetime of naval training had enabled him to choose a purpose worthy of it. Even before he began school, Ramius heard tales from other children about what his dedicated Stalinist father had done in Lithuania in 1940. Marco was deeply ashamed to be the son of a communist butcher. The grandmother who raised him after his mother died kept to the old ways, going to mass every day. Marco remembered her wonderful bedtime stories, religious stories. When his father resumed control of Ramius' life, this religious education faded into memory, neither fully remembered nor fully forgotten. Thus Marco grew up with his own idea about right and wrong, an idea he did not share with the state. It was something he was careful to conceal. It served as an anchor for his soul, and like an anchor it was hidden far below the visible surface. Although outwardly he was the model Soviet child, Inwardly, he decided that he had to find the answers for himself. At the Higher Naval School for Underwater Navigation, the principal submarine school of the Soviet Union, he was first in his class in every subject, in every year. When construction began on the first class of Soviet nuclear-powered submarines, Marco learned how the steel sharks were designed and built. He became an expert in nuclear engineering. He was given command of a new Charlie One-class sub and sent out to challenge the Americans and the British. The American submariners were legendary for their craftiness, and Ramius gradually learned to play the game by American rules. He became a test pilot of submarines. Marco Ramius, now a captain first rank, would take out the first ship of every submarine class to write the book on its strength and weaknesses, to develop operational routines and training guidelines. His career was one uninterrupted story of achievement. Then his wife died. Marco Ramius watched the coffin rolled into the cremation chamber, wishing that he could pray for Natalia's soul, hoping that his grandmother had been right, that there was something beyond the steel door and mass of flame. Only then did he realize that the state had robbed him of a means to assuage his grief with prayer. It had robbed him of the hope, if only an illusion, of ever seeing her again.
Natalia, gentle and kind, had been his only happiness. Now that happiness was gone forever. The life of Natalia Bogdanova Ramius had been lost at the hands of a surgeon who had been drinking while on call. But Marco could not have the doctor punished. The surgeon was the son of a party chieftain. Her life might have been saved by proper medication, but there had not been enough foreign drugs and Soviet pharmaceuticals were untrustworthy. The doctor could not be made to pay. The pharmaceutical workers could not be made to pay. The thought echoed back and forth across his mind, feeding his fury until he decided that the state would be made to pay. The idea had taken weeks to form. Romulus asked for relief from his command so that he could concentrate on the construction and outfitting of the newly designed Red October and select and train his officers beforehand. The request was granted by the commander of the Red Banner Northern Fleet, a sentimental man who had also wept at Natalia's funeral. Romulus had already known who his officers would be. They were men who owed their places and their rank to Romulus, men who had joined the party as told and then become even more dissatisfied with the motherland as they learned that the price of advancement was to prostitute one's mind and soul, to become a highly paid parrot in a blue jacket. Romulus looked around the table at his co-conspirators. And what if they locate us? Kamarov speculated. I doubt that even the Americans can find us when the caterpillar is operating. I am certain that our own submarines cannot. Comrades, I helped design this ship, Romulus said. What will become of us? The missile officer muttered. First, we must accomplish the task at hand. An officer who looks too far ahead stumbles over his own boots. Uh, they will be looking for us, Borodin said. Of course, but they will not know where to look until it's too late. Our mission, comrades, is to avoid detection. And so we shall. The fourth day, Monday, 6 December. CIA headquarters. Jack Ryan walked down the corridor on the top floor of the Langley, Virginia headquarters. He was physically unremarkable, and his blue eyes had a deceptively vacant look. His life included a wife he loved and two children he doted on, a job that tested his intellect and sufficient financial independence to choose his own path. The path Jack Ryan had chosen was in the CIA. Good morning, Dr. Ryan. Oh, hi, Nancy. Uh, you can go right in. Vice Admiral James Greer was reclining in his high-backed judge's chair, reading through a folder. His oversized mahogany desk was covered with neat piles of folders whose edges were bordered with red tape and whose covers bore various code words. Hi, Jack, he called across the room. Coffee? Yes, yes, thank you, sir. James Greer was 66, a naval officer past retirement age who kept working through brute competence. He was a demanding boss, but one who took care of those who pleased him. Ryan was one of these. The admiral sat upright in his chair. So... What brings you over today? Ryan had been stationed in England for the past year working with British intelligence. British photographs of the new Soviet missile boat, Red October, Ryan said between sips. We have ten frames, five each, bow and stern. Morning, James. Ryan turned to see Rear Admiral Charles Davenport, Naval Intelligence. Hi, Charlie. Oh, you know Jack Ryan, don't you? Ryan shook hands. He let them wait a moment before opening his briefcase. He took out four folders, keeping one and handing the others around. Davenport had opened his folder. Oh, she's a big bastard. Forty feet longer than we expected by the look of her. But what are those doors? Well, I don't know. Neither do the Brits. The Red October had two doors at the bow and stern, each about two meters in diameter. Greer reached into his drawer and came out with a magnifying glass. Well, they can't be torpedo tubes. Eh, it must be six, seven feet across. How about launch tubes for the new cruise missile they're developing? Well, that's what the Royal Navy thinks, answered Ryan. But I don't buy it. Uh, I think it's something new. What do you think it is? Greer asked. Uh, beats me, sir. I'm no engineer. Admiral Greer looked his guests over for a few seconds. He smiled and he leaned back in his chair. Okay, Jack, you've set us up for something. Now, why did you bring this over personally? I want to show these to Skip Tyler. He has a doctorate in engineering from MIT. He knows how to think unconventionally. Well, how about his security clearance? Greer asked. Uh, top secret or better? Objections, Charlie? Davenport frowned. Is this the guy who did the evaluation of the Kirov? Yes, sir, now that I think of it. Yes. Well, that was a nice piece of work. Well, it's okay with me. When do you want to see him? Greer asked Ryan. Today, if it's all right with you, sir. 
Greer lifted his phone. Nancy, Dr. Ryan will need a car and a driver in 15 minutes. Right. He set the receiver down. No sense you getting killed out there in the snow. Besides, you're probably driving the wrong side of the road after a year in England. Hmm. Greer watched Ryan leave. He liked Ryan. Ryan had the ability to sort through a pile of data and come out with three or four facts that meant something. This was too rare a thing at the CIA. And Jack was not afraid to say what he thought, whether his bosses liked it or not. The U.S. Naval Academy The loss of his left leg in an auto accident had not taken away Oliver Wendell Tyler's roguish good looks or his zest for life. Ryan found him grading papers in an empty classroom. How's it going, Skip? Ryan leaned against the doorframe. Jack, I thought you were in England. In his own phrase, Tyler jumped to his foot and hobbled over to grab Ryan's hand. His handshake could make a gorilla wince. So, what are you doing here? Ryan opened his briefcase and he handed Tyler a folder. I got some pictures I want you to look at. Okay. Tyler flipped it open. Well, a Russian. Big bastard. Lots of modifications. You never saw these pictures, Skip. Understood? Huh, right. Tyler's eyes twinkle. What do you want me, uh, not to look at them for? Ryan pulled the blow-offs from the back of the folder. These doors, bow and stern. Uh-huh. Tyler set them down side by side. Pretty big. They're two meters or so, paired fore and aft. Well, you notice how the doors converge at the stern? No, I didn't. Tyler looked up. Damn. Damn, I should have realized it off the bat. It's a propulsion system. Marking papers turns your brain to jello. What, propulsion system? We looked at this 20-some years ago. It didn't do anything with it, though. It's too inefficient. Now, go on. Tell me about it. They call it a tunnel drive. You see, you suck water in the bow and your impellers eject it out the stern and that moves the ship. Tyler paused, frowning. They got to the model stage before dropping it. It was supposed to look something like a, well, the compressor sets in a jet engine. Well, why did we drop it? Ryan was taking rapid notes. Well, mostly efficiency. The top speed limit was supposed to be about 10 knots. That just wasn't good enough, even though it did virtually eliminate cavitation sounds. What, cavitation? Yeah, when you have a propeller turning in the water at high speed, you develop an area of low pressure behind the trailing edge of the blade. This can cause water to vaporize. That creates a bunch of little bubbles. They can't last long under the water pressure, and when they collapse, the water rushes forward to pound against the blades. That makes noise. And us subdrivers, we hate noise. Okay, you say that this is a, a silent propulsion system, and it has a top speed limit of about 10 knots? Ryan wanted to be clear on this. Yeah, ballpark figure. I'd have to do some uh, computer modeling to tighten that up. Okay, you get to work on it, Skip. Get us this data by Friday and there's $20,000 in it. You're the first guy who's come up with a sensible explanation for these hatches. If, if you can model this for us, it'll be damn useful. Aye, aye, Jack. Tyler took out a line pad and started listing the things he had to do. CIA Headquarters Ryan was back at the CIA by 8 that evening. It was a quick trip to Greer's office. Skip Tyler says those doors are for a new drive system. Indeed, Greer sat back. Well, tell me about it. Ryan took out his notes and summarized his education in submarine technology. Skip says he can generate a computer simulation of its effectiveness, he concluded. Greer's eyebrows went up. Okay. All right, the Soviets have a new missile boat with a silent drive system. Now, what does it all mean? Well, nothing good. We depend on our ability to track their boomers with our attack boats. This could change the game a bit. So, if this silent drive system really works, they might be able to creep up onto the continental shelf? Depressed trajectory shot, Ryan said. This was one of the nastier nuclear war scenarios in which a sea-based missile might be launched to explode over Washington in less than five minutes' time. Too little for a president to react. If the Soviets were able to kill the president that quickly, the resulting disruption of the chain of command would give them ample time to take out the land-based missiles. There would be no one with authority to fire. You think October was built with that in mind? Well, I'm sure the thought occurred to them. The fifth day, Tuesday, 7 December, Moscow. 
Admiral Yuri Ilyich Podorin was chief political officer of the Soviet Navy. His job was men, not ships. It was a Tuesday morning, and Podorin had a pile of mail waiting on his desk. Near the bottom of the pile was an official-looking envelope from the Red October. Podorin forgot the cigarette smoldering in his ashtray as he reached the bottom of the first page. He started to read it again. His hands began to shake. He phoned Admiral Gorshkov. Comrade Admiral, this is Podorin. I must see you in person immediately. I have a situation here. There was no way he'd discuss this over the phone. He knew it was tapped. The USS Dallas. Sonar man 2nd Class Ronald Jones, his division officer noted, was in his usual trance. The young college dropout was hunched over his instrument table, body limped, eyes closed, face locked into the same neutral expression he wore when listening to one of the many Bach tapes on his expensive personal cassette player. Jones categorized his tapes by their flaws. A ragged piano tempo, a botched flute, a wavering French horn. He listened to sea sounds with the same discriminating intensity. Jones' IQ was 158, the highest on the boat by a fair margin. He had a placid face and sad brown eyes that women found irresistible. The SS Dallas, a 688-class attack submarine, was 40 miles from the coast of Iceland, approaching the entrance to the passage the U.S. Navy was now calling Red Route 1. Jones' trance lasted 10 minutes, longer than usual. He ordinarily had a contact figured out in far less time. I got something, Mr. Thompson. What is it? Lieutenant Thompson leaned against the bulkhead. I don't know. Jones picked up the spare set of phones and handed them to his officer. Listen up, sir. Thompson's eyes screwed shut as he concentrated on the sound. It was a very faint, low-frequency rumble or swish. He couldn't decide. He listened for several minutes before setting the headphones down, and then he shook his head. I got it half hour ago. I lost it, I got it back, I lost it, and I got it back. I mean, it's not screw sounds. It's not whales or fish. It's more like, more like water going through a pipe, except for that funny rumble that comes and goes. Anyway, the bearing's about 250. That puts it between us and Iceland, so it can't be too far away. Commander Mancuso came in just then, the usual mug of coffee in his hand. If there was one frightening thing about the captain, Thompson thought, it was his talent for showing up when something was going on. Did he have the whole boat wired? I just wandered by, he said casually. Oh, what's happening this fine day? Oh, Skipper, Jones picked up a funny signal. The computer says it's magma displacement. And Jonesy doesn't agree with that. Mancuso didn't have to make it a question. Okay, what do you think? Well, I don't know, Captain. It isn't screw sounds, and it isn't any naturally produced sound I've ever heard of. Beyond that, Jones was struck by the informality of the discussion with his commanding officer, even after three years on nuclear subs. The important thing was, if you had something to say, the captain would listen to you. To Jones, this counted for a lot. Mancuso nodded thoughtfully. Well, keep at it. No sense letting all this uh, expensive gear go to waste. Christ, a junior technician bolted upright in his chair. Somebody just stomped on the gas. Damn, Jones shook his head. Uh, Victor, yeah, Victor class for sure. Doing turns for 30 knots, big burst of cavitation noise. Oh, yeah, he's digging big holes in the water, and he doesn't care who knows it. Baron 050, Skipper. Yeah, we got good water around us. The signal's real faint. He, he's not close. He went back to working his controls. I think we know this guy. This is the one with a bent blade on his screw. Sounds like he's got a... A chain wrapped around it. Put on speaker, Mancuso told Thompson. As Jones worked on the sound controls, they heard the whining chirp of propeller cavitation, the thin screech associated with the bent propeller blade, and the deepening rumble of a Victor's reactor plant at full power. The next thing Mancuso heard was the printer. Victor 1 class, number 6, Thompson announced. Right, Jones nodded. Vic 6, bearing still 050. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jones' hand went up. Got another one. He twiddled some knobs. This one's a Charlie class. Well, damned if he ain't digging holes, too. We know this guy, too. Yeah. yeah. Charlie, too, number 11. Jones slipped a phone off one ear and looked at Mancuso. Skipper, the Ruskies have sub-races scheduled for today? Not that they told me about. 
course, we don't get the sports page out here. Mancuso chuckled, swirling the coffee around his cup and hiding his real thought. What the hell was going on? I suppose I'll go forward and take a look at this. Good work, guys. He went a few steps forward into the attack center. So, we have company, Lieutenant Pat Mannion observed. Con sonar, it was Jones' voice. We got another one, sir. Alpha 3, bearing 055, running flat out. Alpha 3? Well, our old friend Napolitowski. I've run across her in a while. Anything else you can tell me? A guess, sir. The sound on this one warbled, then settled down like she was making a turn. I think she's headed this way. That's a little shaky. And we have some more noise to the northeast. Too confused to make any sense of it just now. We're working on it. Okay, nice work, Jonesy. Keep at it. You sure thing, Captain. Mancuso smiled as he set the phone down, looking over at Mannion. You know, Pat, sometimes I wonder if Jonesy isn't part witch. <laughs> He's pretty good. Problem is, he thinks we work for him. Right now, we are working for him. Jones was their eyes and ears, and Mancuso was damn glad to have him. Pat, let's get some sea room. Move us about ten miles east, Mancuso ordered casually. Though not much faster than the Victors and Charlies, and ten knots slower than the smaller Alphas, the Dallas could move almost silently at nearly twenty knots. This was a triumph of engineering and design, the product of decades of work. But moving without being detected was useful only if the hunter could at the same time detect his quarry. Sonars lost effectiveness as their carrier platform increased speed. Submarines running at high speed from one point to another were blind and unable to harm anyone. As a result, the operating pattern of an attack submarine was much like that of a combat infantryman. With a rifleman, it was called dash and cover. With a sub, sprint and drift. After detecting a target, a sub would race to a more advantageous position, stop to reacquire her prey, then dash again until a firing position had been achieved. The sub's quarry would be moving too, and if the submarine could gain position in front of it, she had then only to lie in wait like a great hunting cat to strike. The submariner's trade required more than skill. It required instinct and an artist's touch. Monomaniacal confidence and the aggressiveness of a professional boxer. Mancuso had all of these things. His boat and his crew were performing as well as any man could ask. In Jones, he had one of the ten best sonar operators in the fleet. Mancuso was ready, whatever the game might be. CIA headquarters. It was 4.45 in the morning, and Ryan was dozing fitfully in the back of a CIA Chevy, taking him from the Marriott to Langley. Five and a half hours of sleep in the past, what, 30? Something like that. He was too tired to look at his watch. <laughs> it wasn't fair. Sleeplessness murders judgment. He was in Greer's office five minutes later. I'm sorry to have to wake you up, Jack. Oh, that's all right, sir. Ryan returned the lie. What's up? Come on over and grab some coffee. It's going to be a long day. Ryan walked over to pour a mug of Navy brew. Greer handed him a yellow sheet torn from a Telex machine. Take a look at this. Ryan scanned it. Oh, that's a lot of ships. Must be nearly everything they have at sea. That is every ship they have at sea in the Western Hemisphere. Every damned one. Any ideas? What, well, do they have a war game laid on? No. No, they just finished Crimson Storm a month ago. Ryan nodded. Yeah, they usually take a couple of months to evaluate that much data. And anything else on alert there, Army? Uh, Vovska PVD? Ryan referred to the Soviet Air Defense Network. No, just the subs, and every fast oiler they have is following them out. If they need oilers, they figure to be out for a while. And all scrambled in a few hours. Huh. If they'd planned in advance, we'd have known about it. That's interesting. You've picked up the English habit of understatement, Jack. Greer stood up to stretch. I want you to stay over an extra day. Okay, sir. He looked at his watch. You mind if I phone the wife? I don't want her to drive out to the airport for a plane I'm not on. Sure, sure. If this is just a drill, you can be home tomorrow. The sixth day, Wednesday, 8 December. CIA headquarters. 
The office of the Director of Central Intelligence, Judge Arthur Moore, and Admiral Greer were sitting on a sofa near the picture windows. Greer waved Ryan over and passed him a folder. The folder had a simple white paper label bearing the legends, Eyes Only and Willow. It's all right, Jack, Greer said. You've just been cleared for Willow. Ryan sat back and, despite his excitement, began to read the document slowly and carefully. It was from an agent whose code name was Cardinal, the highest-ranking agent in place the CIA had ever had. He was the stuff that legends are made of. When Ryan finished the report, he referred back to the second page and read it through again, shaking his head slowly. Gentlemen, if this information was hand-delivered by the Archangel Michael, I'd have trouble believing it. But if you gentlemen say it's reliable... They nodded. They wanted his opinion. Ryan took a deep breath and gave them his evaluation. The White House. A Marine guard held the door open for Judge Moore and Jack Ryan. Inside, a Secret Service agent signed them in. Nervous? Moore asked Ryan. Yes, sir. I sure am. <laughs> Moore chuckled. Settle down, boy. The President has wanted to meet you for some time. All in all, I think you'll find he's a pretty regular guy. Just be ready when he asks questions. He'll hear every word you say, and he has a way of hitting you with good ones when he wants. Right. The chiefs were chatting amicably among themselves. The president arrived a minute later. Everyone in the room stood as he walked to his chair on Ryan's right. Gentlemen, if we can bring this meeting to order, I think that Judge Moore has some news for us. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I have asked Dr. Ryan here to deliver the briefing. The president turned to Ryan. The younger man could feel himself being appraised. You may proceed. Ryan took a sip of ice water from a glass hidden in the lectern. Thank you, Mr. President. Gentlemen, my name is Jack Ryan, and the subject of this briefing is recent Soviet naval activity in the North Atlantic. Ryan clicked on the slide projector. The overhead lights near the screen dimmed automatically. He now had everyone's attention. The ship you see here is a Soviet fleet ballistic missile submarine, Red October. Ryan lifted a pointer. The slide showed two views superimposed, bow over stern. Please note the doors here at the bow and here at the stern. We think these doors are the intake and exhaust vents for a new silent propulsion system. Then Ryan explained Tyler's analysis briefly. Okay, Dr. Ryan, the president leaned forward. The Soviets have built a missile submarine that's hard for us to locate. I don't suppose that's news, hmm? Go on. Red October's captain is a man named Marco Ramius, as good a submarine commander as they have. He sailed Red October last Friday. As you all know, early yesterday saw a vast increase in Soviet naval activity. Now, we think we know why all this happened. Ryan clicked to the next slide. This one showed the North Atlantic from Florida to the Pole with 86 Soviet ships marked in red. Gentlemen, this morning we learned that these ships have been ordered to locate Red October, and if necessary, to sink her. Ryan paused for effect. Mr. President, our evaluation of this intelligence data is that Red October is attempting to defect to the United States. The room went very quiet for a minute. Ryan could hear the whirring of the fan in the slide projector. He held his hands on the lectern to keep them from shaking under the stare of the ten men in front of him. How many men on the sub? the president asked. Well, we believe 110 or so, sir. So, 110 men all decide to defect to the United States at one time. Not an altogether bad idea, the president observed, but hardly a likely one. Ryan was ready for that. Mr. President, most mutinies are led by officers, not enlisted men. What if just the officers are doing this? And the rest of the crew is going along with them, asked Dr. Jeffrey Pelt, the national security advisor, knowing what would happen to them and their families. Admiral Foster puffed a few times on his cigar. Ever been on a submarine, Dr. Pelt? You can't see a whole lot. If the officers are doing this, how will the crew know what's going on? The president turned to Ryan. Dr. Ryan, 
Let's assume your scenario is possible. What does the CIA think we ought to do about it? Ryan didn't even look at Judge Moore. We'd grab her, sir. Just like that. Ramius could surface off the Virginia Capes in a day or two and request political asylum. In my opinion, we should welcome him with open arms. Ryan saw nods from all the chiefs. There was silence for a moment. Are you getting confirmation of this information, Judge? The president asked. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are working on that. Good. The president was sitting straight, and Ryan noted his voice became crisper. We have to react to this, whatever they're really up to. Gentlemen, the Soviet Navy is heading for our coast. Mr. President, Mr. President, let's assume for the moment that Dr. Ryan's analysis is correct, said Pelt. I don't see what we can do about it. We can't exactly steal a Russian missile sub. Why not, Foster demanded. Well, an aircraft with a crew of one or two is one thing, Admiral. A nuclear-powered submarine with 26 rockets and a crew of over 100 is something else, said Pelt. So you're saying if the thing comes sailing into Norfolk, Hilton joined in, we give it back? Christ, man! It carries 200 warheads. They just might use those goddamn things against us someday. Ryan saw the president smile. Judge, what are the legal ramifications? Well, I hardly think we need to attach legal falderall to a situation involving nuclear weapons, Admiral Foster said. We might, Admiral, the president mused. I think we are agreed that not all the crew is likely to be in on this. If so, those not party to it will want to return home after it's all over, and we'll have to let them go, won't we? Have to? General Maxwell was doodling on a pad. Hmm. Have to? General, the president said, we will not. Repeat, not be party to murder. Is that understood? He looked around the table. If they know we have her, they'll want her back. And they will know we have her from the crewmen who want to return home. In any case, big as this thing is, how could we hide her? Well, we might be able to, Foster said neutrally. But as you say, the crew is a complication. I suppose that uh, we'll have the chance to look her over. Oh, you mean conduct a quarantine inspection? Check her for seaworthiness, and maybe make sure they're not smuggling drugs into the country, the president grinned. But we have to react to this, whatever they're really up to. Gentlemen, the Soviet Navy is heading for our coast. How many carriers do we have handy? Only one at the moment, sir, Admiral Foster answered. The Kennedy. The English just had one of their carriers, the Invincible, over here. Could you use her, Dan? General Hilton asked. Well, if they let us borrow her, Yes. Do they know of this development, Judge? The President asked. No. No, this information is only a few hours old. With your permission, I have asked Admiral Greer to be ready to fly to England to brief the Prime Minister. Judge, tell Greer to pack his bags. Next, somebody has to go out to brief our fleet commanders. Judge, I want something to back up this fairy tale in 24 hours. He turned to the chiefs. We will meet here tomorrow at 2. Meetings adjourned. The president stood. Moore walked around the table to keep him from leaving at once. Ryan stood outside the door. Jack, uh, would you come back in here a minute? Moore's voice called. You're an historian, right? The president asked, reviewing his notes. Yes, Mr. President, that's what my graduate degree's in. You have a fine sense of the dramatic, Jack. Damn nice briefing. Thank you, Mr. President, Ryan beamed. The judge tells me you know the commander of that British task force. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Admiral White. Good. Somebody has to fly out to brief our fleet commander, then go talk to the Brits, if we get their carrier, as I expect we will. So you fly out to Kennedy tonight, then on to Invincible. Mr. President, I come now, Dr. Ryan. Pelt smiled thinly. You are uniquely suited to this. You already have access to the intelligence. You know the British commander and you're a naval intelligence specialist. You fit. It might be useful, added the president, for me to have somebody out there who can give me an independent civilian point of view. After you get out there, you stay put for a few days and report directly to me. Ryan was silent for a moment. He'd just become a spy, a field officer by presidential fiat. Worse, he'd be spying on his own side. Agreed, Mr. President. Yeah, please forgive me for hesitating. I've never been a field officer before. I understand. The President was magnanimous in victory. 
One more thing. Romulus could just have taken off, not saying anything. Why tip them off? Why did he send a letter to the Kremlin? It was Ryan's turn to smile. No, oh, he figures he can pull this off regardless of what they try to stop him with, and he wants them to know that. Mr. President, the men who drive subs for a living are aggressive, confident, and very, very smart. They like nothing better than making somebody else, a surface ship operator, for example, look like an idiot. You just scored another point, Jack. Ryan shook the president's hand again. After the president and his senior advisor left, he turned to Judge Moore. Judge, what the hell did you tell him about me? Only the truth, Jack. The seventh day, Thursday, 9 December, the North Atlantic. When Samuel Johnson compared sailing in a ship to being in jail with a chance of being drowned, at least he had the consolation of traveling to his ship in a safe carriage, Ryan thought. Now he was going to sea, and before he got to his ship, Ryan stood the chance of being smashed to red pulp in a plane crash. A thin aluminum skin separated him from a 200-knot wind that shrieked in time with twin turbine engines. They were flying through a storm at 5,000 feet, and the plane was jerking up and down in hundred-foot gulps like a berserk roller coaster. Ryan hated flying. The carrier landing was a controlled crash. They were down. They were safe. Probably. The plane finally stopped moving, and the rear hatch opened. Ryan flipped off his seat belts, then darted out of the rear of the aircraft. He ran towards an open, lighted hatch fifty feet away. A Marine standing inside the hatch saluted, welcoming him aboard. The corporal led him to a door with a Marine stationed in front. The sergeant saluted perfectly and opened the door. Ryan walked in and was amazed. Flag quarters on the USS Kennedy might have been transported as a block from a Beacon Hill mansion. One could almost imagine they were not aboard a ship at all except that the ceiling had the usual collection of pipes, all painted gray. It was a decidedly odd contrast to the rest of the room. Ryan had never met the Admiral, but knew him by reputation. Painter was a small, feisty man who could not have weighed more than 130 pounds, a gifted tactician and a man of puritanical integrity. I am Jack Ryan, Admiral Painter. Oh, you work for Admiral Davenport? No, Admiral, I work for James Greer. I am not a naval officer. This uniform was the CIA's idea. This drew a frown. Ryan took the briefing folders from his bag and handed them to Painter. His delivery took 20 minutes. The flag officer was a perfect audience, not interrupting once, only darting a few disbelieving looks at him. God almighty, Painter said when Ryan finished. He rose and walked to the corner to look out at the stormy sea. What are we supposed to do? Well, the exact details of the operation have not been determined. What I expect is that you will be directed to locate Red October and attempt to establish communications with her skipper. <laughs> Ryan, finding a boomer that does not want to be found is not the easiest thing in the world. We practice against our own. We damn near always fail. The Atlantic's a rather large ocean, and a missile sub's noise footprint is very, very small. Yes, sir, Ryan noted to himself that he might have been overly optimistic about their chances for success. The phone rang. Painter here. Yes. Thank you. Well, Invincible just turned around. Good, they're giving her to us along with two tin cans. Okay, gentlemen, let's try and figure a way to run this circus act. Ryan spent the next two hours watching Painter move ships around the ocean like a chess master with his pieces. The USS Dallas. Bart Mancuso had been on duty in the attack center for more than 20 hours. Only a few hours of sleep separated this stretch from the previous one. He'd been eating sandwiches and drinking coffee. Jones looked eager and excited. Skipper, I, I know you're kind of busy, but I think I got something here. That anomalous contact we had the other day has been bothering me. I had to leave it after the ruckus the Rusky subs kicked up, but I was able to come back to it. I, I want to show you what I worked up. Jones flipped open his clipboard. Yesterday morning, night, whatever it was, well, after I got off watch anyway, it, it started bothering me. So I used the move we made offshore as a baseline to do a little course track for him. Now, I, I may be a little off. But all this translates to a course of about 220 and a speed of 10 knots. And that aims him right at the entrance of Route 1, okay? Go on. Jonesy was on to something. Well, I, I couldn't sleep after that, so I, I skipped back to the sonar, and I, I pulled the tape on the contact. 
I had to run it through the computer a few times to filter out all the crap, you know. Then I re-recorded it at, at ten times normal speed. He set his cassette recorder on the chart table. Listen to this, Skipper. The tape was scratchy, but every few seconds there was a thrum. Skipper, that's got to be a man-made sound. It's just too regular for anything else. See, at normal speed, it didn't make much sense, but once I speeded it up, I had the sucker. Okay, Jonesy, finish it. Captain, what you just heard was the acoustical signature of a Russian submarine. He was heading for Route 1, taking the inshore track off the Icelandic coast. You can bet money on that, Skipper. Mancuso took another look at the course track, trying to figure an alternative. There wasn't any. Roger, Jonesy makes sonar man first class today. I want to see the paperwork done by the turn of the next watch, along with a nice letter of commendation for my signature. <laughs> Thanks, Skipper. Jones's smile stretched from ear to ear. You have any idea what it is, Jonesy? Mancusa turned back. The sonar man shook his head. Well, it isn't screw sounds. I, I, I've never heard anything like it. The funny thing is, well, there was this, um, this background noise, kind of like water going through a pipe. It was real faint to start with. Well, anyway, that's, that's outside my field. Well, that's all right. That's all right. You've done enough for one day. If we get close to this guy again, you think you can track him down? Mancusa knew the answer. Oh, you bet, Captain. And now that we know what to listen for, you bet I'll bag that sucker. Radio in for permission to leave Toll Boot Station and track this character down. But Josie gets some rest. It'll be a long, tough hunt. No sweat, Captain. And we'll get him for you. Dismiss, Jonesy. Nice work. Pleasure, Captain. Pat, get us up to periscope depth. We're going to call this one into Norfolk right away. Com subland operations, Norfolk. A bell went off in the operations room as the flash dispatch on the USS Dallas came up on the hot printer. Mancusa reported sonar contact with a Russian sub suspected to be using a new drive system and requested permission to pursue the sub and investigate. Permission which Admiral Vincent Gallery granted immediately. The VK Konovalov. 200 miles northeast of the Dallas, the Konovalov was racing southwest at 41 knots. Captain Tupolev sat alone in the wardroom, rereading the dispatch he'd received two days before. His emotions alternated between rage and grief. The schoolmaster had done it. He was dumbfounded. But what was he to do? Tupolev's orders were explicit. The more so since, as his political officer had pointed out, he was a former pupil of the traitor, Ramius. He, too, could find himself in a very bad position. I have to kill a friend, he thought. Friend? Uh, yes, he admitted to himself. Marco had been a good friend and a fine teacher. Where had he gone wrong? Natalia Bogdanova. Yes. Yes, that had to be it. Oh, a big stink the way that had happened. But nothing was sufficient to justify this madness. Tupolev would get ahead of Marco and wait. Marco would try to slink past and the Konovalov would be there, and the Red October would die. The Invincible Vice Admiral John White led Ryan aft through a short passageway and left into a small compartment. It was surprisingly austere, considering that the English liked their comforts and that White was a peer. I have a message for you. White pulled a slip of paper from his pocket and handed it over. Greer to Ryan, Willow confirmed, Ryan read. Jack tucked it into his pocket. This is good news, sir. A steward arrived with a plate full of sandwiches. So, what's the flap? Admiral, I can tell this to you and three other officers. This is very hot stuff, sir. Hot enough to turn my little fleet around. White lifted the phone and ordered three of his officers to the cabin. They arrived together, two carrying folding metal chairs. Captain Costas... Captain Hunter and Commander Barclay, they are respectively Invincible's commanding officer, operations officer, and intelligence officer. Ryan passed out his two remaining briefing folders and talked from memory. Gentlemen, he concluded, I must insist that this information be kept strictly confidential. For the moment, no one outside this room may learn it. And our mission? White was holding the photographs. For the moment, our mission is to locate Red October. After that, we're not sure. 
I imagine just locating her will be hard enough. The question is, can we do it? If this intelligence is correct, I'd say we have a good chance. We have a good deal of ASWR raid to locate her, and she will be heading towards one of only a few discreet locations. Why isn't Ramius coming on faster? Ryan asked. That's the one thing I can't figure. Once he clears the sonar lines off Iceland, he's clear into the deep basin, so why not crack his throttles wide open and race for our coast? Barkley answered. Well, Romulus probably doesn't know where their attack submarines are, not all of them. He'd run the off chance of blundering into a stray victor and being sunk. Romulus is in the trade of stealth, and he'd likely stick to what he knows, Barkley concluded. Fortunately or unfortunately, he's jolly good at it. The Admiral smiled. Barkley, I want to see your evaluation of what Romulus will do. Assume he's still the clever bastard we've come to know and love. Aye, aye, sir. Barkley stood with the others. Jack, you look exhausted. Get some sleep. There's a cot in the locker over there. If anything comes in for you, we'd get you up. That's kind of you, sir. Admiral White was a good guy. In ten minutes, Ryan was on the cot and asleep. The Red October Every two days, Barodin collected the crew's radiation badges. When he was finished, he took the badges to the ship's medical office. Oh, comrade Petrov, I have a gift for you. Barodin set the leather bag on the physician's desk. Good, the doctor smiled at the executive officer. The developing process was cookbook simple. When the timer dinged, Petrov lifted the rack and held it up against the X-ray reading plate. Nichevo, Petrov breathed. He had to think his badge was fogged all the way to segment four. The engine room crewmen were fogged to segment five, and the torpedo men, who spent all their time forward, showed contamination only in segment one. Son of a bitch. Petrov picked up the phone. Captain Ramius, Petrov here. Could you come after my office, please? On the way, comrade doctor. Ramius took his time. He knew what the call was about. The day before they sailed, Barodin had contaminated all the badges with the X-ray machine. Yes, Petrov. Ramius closed the door behind him. Petrov handed the badges to the captain. Look, look here. Ramius held them up to the light. He frowned. Who knows of this? You and I, comrade captain. You will tell no one, no one. Ramius paused. Any chance that you have made an error? Petrov shook his head emphatically. No, comrade captain. Very well. What we have here, comrade doctor, is a possible minor, minor, Petrov, leak in the reactor spaces. This has happened before, and no one has ever died from it. The leak will be found and fixed. We will keep this little secret. There is no reason to get the men excited. Petrov nodded. Chief Engineer Melikin cleared the reactor compartment before beginning the check for the leak. Lieutenant Sviadov climbed an aluminum ladder to the side of the reactor vessel to run his counter over every welded pipe joint. After several minutes, he reported, All readings in normal range, comrades. Start over, Melikin ordered. From the beginning. Twenty minutes later, Sviadov made an identical report. Have a cigarette, Romeo suggested. You did well, Sviadov. Thank you, comrade captain. The lieutenant handed the counter to Melikin. The lower dial showed a cumulative count well within the safe range. Probably some contaminated badges, the chief engineer commented. It would not be the first time. The more complex piping in the generator room required a full 50 minutes to check. Readings all safe again, comrades. Entirely safe, the captain read off the cumulative dial on the Geiger counter. You'll get more exposure tending a garden. Do you really want to recheck the piping? Melikin asked. I think we should, Ramius said. Sviadov swore to himself, looking down at the deck. An hour later, the second check had been completed. Everything was normal. Melikin ordered the reactor plant restarted. The enlisted men filed back to their duty stations, looking at one another. More than one engine attendant fingered his radiation badge and checked his wristwatch to see how long it would be before he went off duty. The eighth day, Friday, 10 December, CIA headquarters.
Skip Tyler found Admiral Greer sitting in front of his office fireplace. He unlocked his briefcase. Sir, I ran the performance model for this Russian sub. She'll do 7 to 18 knots. The best bet is 10 to 12. With that speed range, you can figure a radiating noise level about the same as that of a Yankee doing six knots. But the character of the noise will be different from what we're used to. A wholly new acoustical signature. Add to that the lower signal intensity, and you have a boat that'll be harder to detect than anything they have at this time. So, so that's what all this says. Greer rifled through the pages. Yes, sir. May, may I ask a question, sir? Well, you can try. Greer leaned back, rubbing his eyes. Red October's going to defect, isn't she? Where'd you get this information? Greer snapped. Admiral, I used to wear the blue suit. Most of my friends still do. I, I hear things. Greer sighed. Commander, if you tell this to anyone, I'll have your other leg mounted over top that fireplace. Do you understand? <laughs> aye, aye, sir. What are we going to do with her? Tyler smiled to himself. He'd sure as hell like a chance to look at a for-real Russian submarine. Give her back. After we've had a chance to look her over, of course. It took Skip a moment to grasp what he'd just been told. Give her back? Why, for Christ's sake? This is not like holding on to a stray fighter plane. The boat is worth a billion dollars. Legally, the president says it's their property. So when they find out that we have her, they'll ask for her back and we'll have to give her back but we'll have a week or so to uh, conduct safety and quarantine inspections to make sure they weren't trying to smuggle cocaine into the country. The admiral laughed. Better to keep her and run her and take her apart, Tyler said quietly, staring into the orange-white flames on the oak logs. How could we keep her, he wondered. An idea began to rattle around in his head. Admiral, what if we could get the crew off without them knowing that we have the submarine? Greer looked into the engineer's face. What do you have in mind? While Tyler explained, Greer listened intently. Greer rose and walked around the couch a few times to get his circulation going. Interesting. Interesting. The timing would be almost impossible, though. I didn't say it would be easy, sir, just that we could do it. The Ninth Day Saturday, 11 December. The Pentagon. You must be Skip Tyler. General Ed Harris looked up from a large chart table as Dr. Tyler walked in. And you're going to tell us how we can hold on to that maverick Russian sub? Yes, sir. Huh? Well, tell me about it. Harris listened to the younger man for five minutes, sipping his coffee and devouring a couple of jelly donuts. Oh, son of a gun, he observed when Tyler finished. I like it. The Joint Chiefs arrived three minutes later. Tyler had never seen so many stars in one room. You wanted to see all of us, Eddie? Hilton asked. Yes, General. This is Dr. Skip Tyler. Admiral Foster came over first to take his hand. Yeah, you got us that performance dead on Red October that we were just briefed on. It's good work, Commander. Dr. Tyler thinks we should hold on to her if we get her, Harris said deadpan and he thinks he has a way we can do it. Tyler explained. It took ten minutes since he had to answer questions and use the chart to diagram time and space constraints. When he was finished, General Barnes was at the phone, calling the commander of the Military Airlift Command. Foster left the room to call Norfolk, and Hilton was on his way to the White House. The Red October Except for those on watch, every officer was in the wardroom. Again, the door was locked. Comrades, Petrov reported, the second set of badges was contaminated, worse than the first. Romulus noted that Petrov was rattled. He had chosen his ship's doctor well. Regulations require that I report this. Your adherence to the rules is noted, comrade doctor, Romulus said. And now... Regulations stipulate that we make yet another check. Malekin, I want you and Borodin to do it personally. First, check the radiation instruments themselves. If they're working properly, we will be certain the badges are defective or have been tampered with. All officers were all back in the wardroom half an hour later. 
Passing crewmen noticed this, and already the whispering started. Comrades, Melikin announced, we have a major problem. On the table was a Geiger counter stripped into a score of small parts. Next to it was a radiation detector taken off the reactor room bulkhead, its inspection cover removed. Sabotage, Melikin hissed. It was a word fearsome enough to make any Soviet citizen shudder. The room went deathly still. I believe that an imperialist agent has sabotaged our ship. First, he disabled our radiation monitor instruments. Then he probably arranged a low-level leak in our hot piping. It would appear, comrades, that Comrade Petrov was correct. We may have a leak. Comrades, said Petrov, these are not lethal doses. We do face a serious problem here, but it's not a life-threatening emergency. Malakin, the captain asked, it is my engine plant and my responsibility. Borodin will assist me. We will personally repair these and conduct a thorough investigation of all reactor systems. I am too old to have children. For the moment, I suggest that we deactivate the reactor and proceed on battery. I also recommend that we reduce reactor watches to two hours. Agreed, Captain. Certainly, comrade. I know that there is nothing you cannot repair. I will keep this secret. There is no reason to excite the crew over what may be nothing. And it most is something we can handle on our own. Ramius ended the meeting. Within two hours, the entire crew knew that something was wrong and that their officers had not yet figured out a way to deal with it. The cooks bringing food forward from the galley to the crew spaces were seen to linger in the bow as long as they could. Men standing watch in the control room shifted on their feet more than usual, Ramius noted, hurrying forward at the change of watch. The Kremlin Admiral Yuri Ilyich Podorin found himself seated at the far end of a long conference table looking at the grim faces of the ten Politburo members. Party General Secretary and President of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, Andrei Narmanov, shifted his gaze to Podorin. His face gave nothing away. It never did, unless he wished it to, which was rare enough. Comrade Admiral, he began coldly, we have heard from Comrade Goshkov what the chances are of finding and destroying this rebellious submarine. We are not pleased, nor are we pleased with the fantastic error in judgment that gave command of our most valuable ship to this slug, Ramius. What I want to know from you, comrade, is what happened to the political officer aboard. Fedorian had prepared himself for this over several days. Whatever his fate might be, he was determined to meet it with dignity. Comrade General Secretary, he began, the most likely explanation is that he was murdered. Fedorian continued, he alone of the officers left behind a wife and family. Mikart Alexandreov, the party theoretician, inquired, Now that we are in this mess, how do we get out of it? Padorin took a deep breath. He'd been waiting for this. Comrades, we have another man aboard Red October, unknown to either Putin or Captain Ramius. He reports directly to our office by passing all operational channels. He is the ship's cook. Uh, and what are this boy's orders? Narmanov asked. Comrade General Secretary, in a true emergency, his orders are to destroy the ship and make his escape. This is possible? Narmanov asked. This Loginov's cover as the ship's cook is a better cover assignment than you may imagine. See, he travels between the officers' accommodations, the galley, the crew's quarters, many times a day, and his presence in any particular area will not be thought unusual. Go on. Red October carries solid fuel Seahawk missiles. One has a range safety package installed. Range safety? Narmanov was puzzled. Comrades, when we test our missiles, we have safety packages aboard to explode them if they go off course. Otherwise, they might land on one of our own cities. Loginov has been trained to activate the safety package, set a timer, and escape. Well, not just to destroy the ship. No, Comrade General Secretary, it is too much to ask. 
A young man must have at least the possibility of escape, otherwise human weakness might lead to failure. This is reasonable, Alexandrov said. Young men are motivated by hope, not fear. In this case, young Loginov would hope for a considerable reward. And get it, Narmanov said. The Tenth Day, Sunday, 12 December Norfolk Naval Shipyard The USS Ethan Allen was about at the end of her string. Commissioned in 1961, she had served her crews and her country for over 20 years. Now she was old enough to vote, and this was very old for a submarine. Her missile tubes had been filled with ballast and sealed months before. Ethan Allen's was a generation-old technology. Admiral Gallery had come aboard early that morning. He had been her first skipper years before. He'd recognized some of the senior chiefs and asked them if the old girl had any life left in her. To a man, the chief said yes. The admiral had toured the entire length of the Ethan Allen's hull. She'd do it, Gallery knew. She'd do fine. It was not the end he would have preferred for his fighting ship, but to Ethan Allen would die for a purpose. A crazy purpose. Perhaps crazy enough to work, he said to himself. Gallery spoke with all of the senior men individually. Each of the old chiefs stayed aboard. Partly it was a chance for one last cruise on the old girl, a chance to say goodbye to a friend. Mostly it was because Gallery said it was important, and the old-timers remembered that his word had been good once. The USS Ethan Allen sailed for the last time at 23.45 hours. The skipper eased her deftly away from the dock with gentle engine commands and strains on his lines that his quartermaster could only admire. No tugs, no nothing, he reported to his bunkmate later. Yeah, the old man knows his shit. In an hour they were past the Virginia Capes and ready to dive. Ten minutes later, they were gone from sight. The Ethan Allen responded like a champ, steaming at twelve knots, her old machinery hardly making any noise at all. The eleventh day, Monday, 13 December. The Dallas. For over two days, Jones had had only an odd hour of sleep here and there. Well, that's what they pay me for, he reflected bleakly. The large towed sonar array was at the end of a thousand-foot cable. Jones referred to the use of it as trolling for whales. It was their most sensitive sonar rig. Jones had heard all sorts of things on it, subs and surface ships all the time, low-flying aircraft on occasion. Then off Bermuda, they had encountered mating humpbacks, and a very impressive noise that was. He smiled to himself. Suddenly Jones leaned forward, pressing the headphones tight against his head. He tore a page of doodles from his scratch pad and noted the time on a fresh sheet. Mr. Thompson, he said quietly, not looking around, can you ask the skipper if maybe we can swing more easterly and drop down a knot or two? Thompson went out into the passageway to relay the request. New course and engine orders were given in 15 seconds. Mancuso was in sonar 10 seconds after that. Jones was sitting as usual, hunched over his table, his left hand up, commanding quiet. His cigarette burned away unnoticed in the ashtray. He reached up, switched a tape recorder on, then turned to see his captain looking down at him. Jones' face broke into a thin, tired smile. Yeah, I just barely got it now. Roughly north, I think. I, I need some time on that. Mancuso looked at the intensity needle Jones was tapping. It was down to zero. Almost. Every 50 seconds or so, it twitched just a little. Jones was making furious notes. It's getting louder, Skipper. He leaned back and lit a cigarette. Yeah, he's heading our way. I make him 350, maybe more like 353. Three. Still real faint, but that's our boy. We got him. Jones decided to risk an impertinence. We wait or we chase, sir? We wait. And no sense spooking him. We let him come in nice and close while we do our famous imitation of a hole in the water, and then we tag along behind him to wax his tail for a while. I want his signature recorded, digitalized, folded, spindled, and mutilated. I want to know everything there is about him, his propulsion noises, his plant signature, the works. I want to know exactly who he is. Well, he's a Rusky, sir. But which Rusky? Mancuso smiled. Uh, aye, Captain. Jones understood. He'd be on duty another two hours. But the end was in sight. The Twelfth Day. Tuesday, 14 December. The Dallas. Crazy Ivan, Jones shouted loudly enough to be heard in the attack center. Turning to starboard. 
All stop, Mancusa ordered quickly. Rig ship for Alta Quiet. A thousand yards ahead of the Dallas, her contact had just begun a radical turn to the right. She'd been making a complete circle about every two hours since they'd regained contact, though not regularly enough for the Dallas to settle into a comfortable pattern. Whoever's driving that boomer knows his business, Mancuso thought. Countering this maneuver was more than just tricky. It was dangerous, especially the way Mancuso did it. When the Red October changed course, her stern, like those of all ships, moved in the direction opposite the turn. She was a steel barrier directly in the Dallas's path. This characteristically Russian tactic for forcing Americans to keep their distance was a stylized turn called the Crazy Ivan in the U.S. Navy. The first few hours they had trailed this contact, Mancuso had been careful to keep his distance. The submarine was not turning quickly. He suspected that the Russian skipper was not using his full maneuverability, an intelligent thing for a captain to do, keeping some of his performance in reserve as a surprise. These facts allowed the Dallas to trail very closely indeed, and gave Mancuso a chance to chop his speed and drift forward so that he barely avoided the Russian stern. He was getting good at it. A little too good, his officers were whispering. The last time they'd not missed the Russian screws by more than 150 yards. Mancuso went aft to sonar. Target's still turning right, Jones reported as he caught the captain out of the corner of his eye. Hey, Skipper, this guy, I mean, he's real confident in himself. I, I mean, real confident. It's almost like, like he's doing this out of habit, you know? Like he's in a hurry to get somewhere and really doesn't think anybody can track him. Mancuso took a spare set of phones and plugged them in to listen. The noise was the same. A swish, and every 40 or 50 seconds, an odd, low-frequency rumble. This close, they could also hear the gurgling and throbbing of the reactor pump. There was a sharp sound, maybe a cook moving a pan on a metal grate. No silent ship drill on this boat. Mancuso smiled to himself. It was like being a cat burglar. He's past us on the port bow. I think the turn stopped. Jones looked up with a grin. <laughs> we did it again, Skipper. Okay, good work, you men. Mancuso went back to the attack center. Everyone was waiting expectantly. Let's get the engine turned back on. Build her up slowly to 13 knots. A few seconds later, an almost imperceptible noise began as the reactor plant increased power. A moment after that, the speed gauge twitched upward. The Dallas was moving again. Attention, this is the captain speaking, Mancuso said. They circle us again without picking us up. Well done, everybody. We can all breathe again. He placed the handset back in its holder. Mr. Goodman, let's get back on her tail. Com subplant operations. Sam, this is Vince. Listen up. Dallas reports she's tracking a Russian boomer with a new kind of quiet drive system about 600 miles southeast of the Grand Banks. All right. That's Mancuso, Admiral Dodge said. Bartolomeo Vito Mancuso, Gallery confirmed. I told you the kid was good, Sam. The Pentagon. The president says we can try and keep her, asked Lieutenant General Harris. Well, if we can get her to the place we want at the time we want, General Hilton said. Right. Well, now let's tell Dallas to sit tight and track the booger, Harris said, and report any changes in course of speed. Aye, aye. Dodge went to the phone and ordered Admiral Gallery to send the reply, also praising her for a job well done. We've got to warn this Rusky off, Admiral Foster declared. Damn, I don't want him to get this close, then get blown away right off our coast. But how are we going to communicate with a gentleman? asked Hilton. The Invincible. How far is she from us? Ryan asked. Mm, Two hundred miles. We can be there in ten hours. Captain Hunter marked the position on the chart. My God, this guy's come four thousand miles. He's going to get killed within sight of his objective, Ryan said. How to communicate with a submarine? Commander Barkley straightened up. Gentlemen, we are not trying to communicate with a submarine. We are trying to communicate with a man. What are you thinking? Hunter asked. What do we know about Marco Ramius? Barclay's eyes narrowed. Boy, he's a cowboy. Typical submarine commander, thinks he can walk on water, Captain Carstairs said. Hmm, he who spent most of his time in attack submarines, Barclay said. Marco's bet his life that he could sneak into an American port undetected by anyone. We have to shake that confidence to warn him off. We have to talk to him first, Ryan said sharply. And so we shall, Barclay smiled the thought now fully formed in his mind. They discussed Barclay's idea for an hour. Then Ryan transmitted it to Washington for approval. The 13th day, Wednesday, 15 December. The Dallas. 
Crazy Ivan, Jones called out again. Turning to port. Okay, all stop, Mancuso ordered, holding a dispatch in his hand, which he'd been rereading for hours. He was not pleased with it. All stop, sir, the helmsman responded. All back full. All back full, sir. The helmsman dialed in the command and turned, his face a question. Throughout the Dallas, the crew heard noise. Too much noise. Instant vibration and cavitation noises aft. Right full rudder. Right full rudder, aye. Con, sonar, we are cavitating. Jones spoke over the intercom. Very well, sonar, Mancuso answered. He did not understand his new orders, and things he didn't understand made him angry. Jesus, Jones said in the sonar room. What's the skipper doing? Mancuso was in sonar a second later. Still doing a turn to port, Captain. He's a stern of us because of the turn we made, Jones observed as neutrally as he could. It was close to an accusation, Mancuso noticed. Flushing the game, Jonesy, Mancuso said coolly. Huh, you're the boss, Jones thought, smart enough not to say anything else. The captain looked as though he was going to snap somebody's head off. Engine noise is diminishing, sir. He's slowing down. Jones paused. Sir, it's a fair guess he heard us. He was supposed to, Mancuso said. The Red October. Captain, an enemy submarine, the Mimon said. Enemy? Ramius asked. American. He must have been trailing us, and he had to back down to avoid a collision when we turned. He's definitely an American, broad under port bow, range under one kilometer, I think. He handed Ramius his phones. Damn, Ramius said to Borodin. He must have stumbled across us in the past two hours. Ah, bad luck. The Dallas. Somebody on the surface, Jones said suddenly. Where the hell did they come from? It's, Skipper, there was nothing, nothing a minute ago, and now I'm getting engine sounds, too. Maybe more, like they were sitting up there waiting for us. Damn, I didn't hear a thing. Limey's, Jones said a moment later. The big ship off to the south is one of the baby carriers, sir. Mancuso nodded. Hmm. HMS Invincible. Yeah, she was over our side of the lake for Nifty Dolphin. That means the Brit Varsity, their best operators. The Invincible. Positive sonar contact, came from the metal speaker. Two submarines range two miles from Invincible, bearing zero two zero. Now for the hard part, Admiral White said. Ryan and four Royal Naval officers were on the flag bridge. As the Invincible steamed slowly north, all five men swept the contact area with powerful binoculars. Come on, Captain Ramius, Ryan said quietly. You're supposed to be a hotshot. Prove it. The Red October. Romulus was back in his control room, scowling at his chart. A stray American Los Angeles stumbling onto him was one thing, but he'd run into a small task force. English ships at that. Why? Probably an exercise. Well, he'd have to evade before he could get on with what he wanted to do. This would take the best part of a day. But now he'd have to see what he was up against. Besides, it would show them that he was confident that he could hunt them if he wished. Borodin... Bring the ship to periscope depth. Battle stations. The Invincible. Come up, Marco, Barkley urged. We have a message for you, old boy. Contact is coming up, the speaker said. All right, Ryan pounded his hand on the rail. The distance to the Red October was down to a mile and a half. Contact depth is 500 feet, coming up slowly. Hunter, are you up on your morse? Admiral White inquired. I believe so, Admiral, Hunter answered. Everyone was getting excited. The Dallas. Hull popping noises, sir, Jones said. I think he's heading up. Up? Mancuso wondered for a second. Yeah, yeah, that fits. He's a cowboy. He wants to see what he's up against before he tries to obey. Now that fits. I bet he doesn't know we've been here the past two days. The captain went forward to the attack center. Well, looks like he's going up, Skipper, Mannion said, watching the attack director. We go up too, Skipper? Yeah. Yep. Slow and easy. The Invincible. They had agreed that the best method of passing the message would be to use a blinker light. Only someone placed in the direct line of sight would be able to read the signal. Hunter moved to the light, holding a sheet of paper Ryan had given him. The Red October. Thirty meters, Comrade Captain, Borodin reported. 
the battle watch was set in the control center. Periscope, Romeo said calmly. The oiled metal tube hissed upward on hydraulic pressure. The captain bent to look into the eyepiece. So, we have here three imperialist ships, HMS Invincible. Oh, such a name for a ship, he scoffed for his audience. Two escorts, Bristol, and a Conti-class cruiser. The Invincible. Periscope, starboard bow, the speaker announced. I see it. Barkley's hand shot out to point. There it is. Ryan strained to find it. Yeah, I got it. It was like a small broomstick sitting vertically in the water about a mile away. To Ryan's left, the captain began jerking his hand on the lever that controlled the light shutters. The Red October. Romulus didn't see it at first. He was making a complete circle of the horizon, checking for any other ships or aircraft. When he finished the circuit, the flashing light caught his eye. Quickly, he tried to interpret the signal. It took him a moment to realize it was pointed right at him. Red October, Red October, can you read this? Can you read this? Please ping us one time on active sonar if you can read this. Please ping us one time on active sonar. The message kept repeating. The signal was jerky and awkward. Ramius' knuckles went white on the periscope hand grips as he translated the message in his mind. Borodin, he said finally after reading the message a fourth time, we set up a practice firing solution on Invincible. A single ping, comrade, just one for range. The Invincible. One ping from the contact area, sir. Sound Soviet, the speaker reported. White lifted his phone. Thank you. Keep us informed. He set it back down. Well, gentlemen, he did it, Ryan sang out. Send the rest, for Christ's sake. At once. Hunter grinned like a madman. Red October, Red October, your whole fleet is chasing after you. Your path is blocked. Numerous attack submarines are waiting to attack you. Proceed to rendezvous 33 degrees north, 75 degrees west. We have ships there waiting for you. Repeat. Proceed to rendezvous 33 degrees north, 75 degrees west. If you understand and agree, please ping us again one time. The Red October. Distance to target, Borodin, Romulus asked, wishing he had more time as the message was repeated again and again. Two thousand meters, comrade captain, a nice fat target for us if we... Yeah. His voice trailed off as he saw the look on his commander's face. They know our name, Romulus was thinking. They know our name. How can this be? They knew where to find us exactly. How? How long has the Los Angeles been trailing us? Decide. You must decide. Comrade, one more ping on the target. Just one. 33 degrees north. 75 degrees west. The USS Ethan Allen had been on station now for more than 30 hours. The small complement of officers and senior chiefs was working in an informal atmosphere. The quartermaster asked, Commander, can I ask what the hell we're doing? Well, I wish I knew, Chief. Mostly we're waiting for something. Yeah, but what, sir? Hm. Damned if I know. The Red October Melikin and Kirill Surjoy, the assistant engineer, had the duty in the engine room. The engine room crewmen were the most rattled on the vessel. The supposed contamination was common knowledge. There are no long-lived secrets on a submarine. Comrade Melikin, Surjoy called. I'm showing pressure fluctuation on the main loop, number six gauge. A loud two-phase buzzer and a rotating red alarm light went off. Human, get forward, Melikin ordered next. There was no hesitation. No, you! Connect battery power to the Caterpillar motors quickly! The warrant officer, the last man out of the compartment, made certain that the hatches were dogged down tight before running to the control room. What is the problem? Ramius asked calmly. Radiation alarm in the heat exchange room. Uh, very well, very well. Go forward and shower with the rest of your watch and get control of yourself. Ramius patted him on the arm. You are a trained man. The crewmen look to you for leadership. Romulus lifted the phone. What has happened, comrade? 
The control room crew watched their captain listen to the answer. They could not help but admire his calm. Radiation alarms had sounded throughout the hull. Ah, uh, very well. We do not have too many hours of battery power left, comrade. We must go to snorkeling depth. Stand by to activate the diesel. Yes. He hung up. Comrades, you will listen to me. Ramius' voice was under total control. There has been a minor failure in the reactor control systems. The alarm you heard was not a major radiation leak, but rather a failure of the reactor rod control systems. We will, therefore, complete our cruise on diesel power. A minute later, everyone aboard felt the vibration as the October's massive diesel engine cranked on battery power. Throughout the hull, men waited for the rumble that would mean the engine had caught and could generate power to run the electric motors. It didn't catch. The 14th day, Thursday, 16 December. The Invincible. Ryan watched as the medics carried the stretcher into the sick bay. Another crewman appeared a minute later with a briefcase. He had this, sir. Thank you. White took the case. The Pentagon had sent four Russian-speaking career intelligence officers to board the Red October, but mechanical failure had sent their helicopter to the bottom. Now let's get this case open, Admiral. I need to see what this plan is. They picked up a machinist mate on the way to White's cabin. He proved to be an excellent locksmith. Dear God, Ryan breathed, reading the contents of the case. Well, you better see this. Well, 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 White said a few minutes later. Yes, this is clever. Ten minutes later, Jack was speaking over the encrypted voice channel, hoping the scrambling device worked. Yes, I hear you fine, Mr. President. You know what happened to the helicopter. Yes, Jack, most unfortunate. I need you to pinch hit for us. I can't order you, but you know what the stakes are. Will you do it? Ryan closed his eyes. Affirmative. I appreciate it, Jack. Sure you do. Sir, I need your authorization to take some help with me, a few British officers. One, the president said. Sir, I, I need more than that. One. Understood, sir. We'll be moving in an hour. You know what's supposed to happen. Yes, sir. The survivor had the ops orders with him. I've already read them over. And good luck, Jack. Thank you, sir. Out. Ryan flipped off the satellite channel and turned to Admiral White. Volunteer once, just one time, and see what happens. Frightened? White did not appear amused. Yeah, damn right I am. Can I borrow an officer, a guy who speaks Russian, if possible? You know what this may involve. Five minutes later, they were back in White's cabin. Ryan weighed the ethics of accepting the man before telling him what was involved. I'm Jack Ryan. He extended his hand. Owen Williams. And so, what are we up to? Well, the submarine's named Red October, and she's attempting to defect to the United States. Indeed. Oh, so that's what we've been mocking about for. Well, jolly decent of a CO. It just how certain are we of this? Ryan took several minutes to detail the intelligence information. We blinkered instructions to him. Seems to have played along, but we don't know for sure until we get aboard. Defectors have been known to change their minds. <laughs> it happens a lot more often than you might imagine. You, uh, you still want to come along? Oh, and miss a chance like this? William smiled. Ryan took another friend along. An FN 9mm automatic pistol with a spare clip and a shoulder holster that disappeared nicely under Ryan's jacket. The mission orders were shredded and burned before they left. 33 degrees north, 75 degrees west. The scamp rendezvoused with the Ethan Allen a few minutes after midnight. The attack sub took up station a thousand yards astern of the old missile boat, and both cruised in an easy circle as their sonar operators Listen to the approach of a diesel-powered vessel, the USS Pigeon. Three of the pieces were now in place. The plan was simple enough. They were going to get everyone off the Red October who might want to return to Russia, then pretend to blow up the ship with one of the powerful scuttling charges Russian ships are known to carry. 
The remaining crewmen would then take their boat northwest into Pamlico Sound to wait for the Soviet fleet to return home, sure that the Red October had been sunk, and with the crew to prove it. The Red October Romulus looked through his periscope. The only ship in view was the USS Pigeon. He watched the blinker light, translating the message in his mind. So this was their plan. Comrades, officers and men of Red October, this is the captain speaking. Romulus's voice was subdued, the crewman noted. The incipient panic that had started a few hours earlier had driven them to the brittle edge of riot. Efforts to repair our engines have failed. Our batteries are nearly flat. We have no choice. We must abandon ship. It is no accident that an American ship is now close to us, offering what they call assistance. An imperialist spy has sabotaged our ship. They are waiting for us, comrades, waiting and hoping to get their dirty hands on our ship. They will not. The crew will be taken off. The senior officers and I will remain behind to set off the scuttling charges. The Mystic The DSRV Mystic was nothing more than three metal spheres welded together with a directional propeller on the back, which worked them carefully into place. A petty officer made certain that the mating skirt was securely fastened. The water in the skirt between Mystic and Red October was explosively vented into a low-pressured chamber on the DSRV. This established a firm seal between the two vessels, and the residual water was pumped out. Your ball now, I guess. The lieutenant motioned Ryan to the hatch in the floor of the middle segment. I guess. Ryan knelt by the hatch and banged a few times with his hand. No response. Next, he tried a wrench. A moment later, three clangs echoed back, and Ryan turned the locking wheel in the center of the hatch. When he pulled the hatch up, he found another that had already been opened from below. The lower perpendicular hatch was shut. Ryan took a deep breath and climbed down the ladder and knocked on the lower hatch. The Red October. It opened at once. Gentlemen, I am Commander Ryan, United States Navy. Can we be of assistance? The man he spoke to was shorter and heavier than himself. He wore three stars on his shoulder boards, an extensive set of ribbons on his breast, and a broad gold stripe on his sleeve. So this was Marco Ramius. Do you speak Russian? No, sir, I do not. What is the nature of your emergency, sir? We have a major leak in our reactor system. The ship is contaminated aft of the control room. We must evacuate. At the words leak and reactor, Ryan felt his skin crawl, and the looks he was getting from the 20 men in this compartment were lethal. Dear God. And okay, let's get moving then. We can take off 25 men at a time, sir. Uh, not so fast, Commander Ryan. What will become of my men? Ramius asked. Well, they will be treated as our guests, of course. If they need medical attention, they'll get it. They'll be returned to the Soviet Union as quickly as we can arrange it. Romulus grunted and turned to speak with the others in Russian. Dr. Petrov, Romulus said, you will take the first group of 25. Keep control of the men. Do not let the Americans speak to them as individuals and let no man wander off alone. Understood, Comrade Captain. Ryan watched Petrov count the men off as they passed through the hatch and up the ladder. They heard the DSRV disengage and motor off. The silence that ensued was as long as it was awkward. Ryan and William stood in one corner of the compartment, Romulus and his men opposite them. May I ask your name, sir? Ryan said. Marco Alexandrovich Romulus. Oh, Jack Ryan, sir. Uh, Owen Williams. They shook hands all around. They heard the mystic's electric motors overhead. A moment later came the metallic clang of the mating collar gripping the escape trunk. It had taken 40 minutes, but it had seemed like a week. God, what if the reactor really was bad, Ryan thought. When the third set of crewmen left under the control of Lieutenant Sviadov, the cook at the end of the line silently broke away. The Pigeon On the Pigeon, the Soviet crewmen were taken to the crew's mess. 
The American sailors were observing their Russian counterparts closely, but no words passed. The Russians found the table set with a meal of coffee, bacon, eggs, and toast. Petrov was happy for that. It was no problem keeping control of the men when they ate like wolves. With a junior officer acting as interpreter, they asked for, and they got, plenty of additional bacon. The cooks had orders to stuff the Russians with all the food they could eat. The Red October. <sighs> Last group, Ryan murmured to himself. The mystic made it again. The last round trip had taken an hour. Ramius ordered Ivanov to take the next group. Ramius took the young officer's hand. If something happens, tell them in Moscow that we have done our duty. Yes, I will do that, comrade captain. Ivanov nearly choked on the answer. Ryan watched the sailors leave. One minute later, the mini-sub lifted free. Commander Ryan... Ramius said, drawing himself to attention. My officers and I request political asylum in the United States, and we bring you this small present. Ramius gestured toward the steel bulkheads. Ryan had already framed his reply. Captain, on behalf of the President of the United States, it's my honor to grant your request. Welcome to freedom, gentlemen. No one knew that the intercom system in the compartment had been switched on. The indicator light had been unplugged hours before. Two compartments forward. The cook listened. The Ethan Allen The mystic's fourth return was the signal for the Ethan Allen to act. Her captain was already assembling his men in the torpedo room, ready to evacuate. One of the officers was trailing a black wire that led to each one of the bombs aboard. This he connected to a timing device. All ready, Captain. The Red October. Ryan was trying to relax and failing at it. Aft, the engine room crew had begun powering up the reactor. Romulus was speaking over the intercom phone with his chief engineer. Ryan's head went up. It was as though he felt the sound before hearing it. What was that? He said automatically, knowing already what it was. I heard a shot. No, uh, several shots. Ramius looked amused as he came a few steps forward. I think you hear the sounds of the Caterpillar engines, and I think the first time on a submarine is always difficult. Ryan stood up. That may be, Captain, but I know a shot when I hear it. He unbuttoned his jacket and he pulled out the pistol. Where are Williams and Kamarov? Ramius shrugged. Uh, this is a big ship. We will go forward. I will show you my submarine has no ghosts. Ryan went with him to the missile room door, which was locked in place with a central wheel. He turned the wheel and pulled the door open slowly. The missile compartment was a good 200 feet long, lit only by six or eight small glow lights. Hadn't it been brightly lit before? At the far end was a splash of bright light, and the far hatch had... Two shapes sprawled on the gratings next to it. Neither moved. The light Ryan saw them by was flickering next to a missile tube. Ghosts, Captain, he whispered. Ryan stepped out of his shoes and entered the compartment. He pulled the hatch shut behind him and moved to his right. A light seemed to be coming from the furthest missile tube on the starboard side of the upper missile deck. Ryan stopped to listen. Something was happening there. He could hear a low, rustling sound, and the light was moving as though it came from a handheld work lamp. The sound was traveling down the smooth sides of the interior hull plating. He'd have to get past 13 missile tubes to get to the source of that light, cross over 200 feet of open deck. He moved around the first one, pistol in his right hand at waist level, his left tracing the cold metal of the tube. He got between the first and second tubes, looked to port to make sure nobody was there, and got ready to move forward. Twelve to go. A hand came down on his shoulder. Ryan jumped and whirled around. Ramius. He had something to say, but Ryan put his fingertips on the man's lips and shook his head. Ryan gestured his intention to go around the outboard side of each missile. Ramius indicated that he would go around the inboard sides. Ryan nodded. 
Ryan edged around the next tube, his fingers flexing nervously on the pistol grip, wanting to wipe the sweat from his eyes. It took five minutes to get halfway down the compartment, between the sixth and seventh tubes. The noise from the forward end of the compartment was much more pronounced now. The light was definitely moving. Not by much, but the shadow of the number one tube was jittering ever so slightly. What was he doing? Working on a missile? For the first time, Romulus noticed that Ryan's shoes were off, and thinking that was a good idea, he lifted his left foot to take off a shoe. It fell on the loose piece of grating with a clatter. Ryan was caught in the open. He froze. The light at the far end shifted, then went dead still. He saw part of a face and a flash. The bullet hit the after bulkhead with a clang. He drew back for cover. He saw the face, and this time he fired first, knowing he'd miss. At the same moment, he pushed Romulus left. The captain raced to the other side and crouched behind a missile tube. We have you, Ryan said. You have nothing. It was a young voice, young and very scared. What was Ryan dealing with? A sailor who stayed behind? One of Romulus's own officers who'd had second thoughts? A KGB agent? The light moved. Whatever he was doing, he was trying to get back to it. Ryan took a deep breath and leaped around the next tube. The guy was waiting for this. Ryan dove to the deck and the bullet missed him. Who are you? Ryan asked. A Soviet patriot. You are the enemy of my country and you shall not have this ship. He was talking too much, Ryan thought. You have a name? My name is of no account. How about a family? Ryan asked. My parents. They will be proud of me. You don't have to die, my friend. If you could just set that gun down. Yeah, and the CIA will not kill me, hmm? The voice sneered. I am no fool. If I'm to die, then it will be to my own purpose, my friend. Then the light clicked out. Ryan had wondered how long that would take. Did it mean that he'd finished whatever the hell he was doing? If so, in an instant, they'd all be gone. Or maybe the guy just realized how vulnerable the light made him. Maybe we can make a deal, Ryan suggested. Ah, oh, yes, yes. We can decide which ear the shot comes in. Maybe you'd like being an American. And my parents, Yankee. What of them? Well, maybe we can get them out, Ryan said, moving left as he waited for a reply. Now there were two missile tubes separating them. Romulus moved first. Out of the corner of his eye, he caught the shape of the captain running toward the forward bulkhead. Romulus leaped at the bulkhead and flicked a light switch on as the enemy fired at him. Ryan ran forward. As he covered the distance between the last two missile tubes, he saw Romulus go down. Ryan dove past the number one missile tube. He landed on his left side, ignoring the pain that set his arm on fire as he rolled to line up his target. The man was turning as Ryan jerked off six shots. Ryan didn't hear himself screaming. Two rounds connected. The agent was lifted off the deck and twisted halfway around from the impact. His pistol dropped from his hand as he fell limp to the deck. Captain, Ryan called. You okay? I'm wounded, but I think I shall live. Ryan, who is it? How the hell should I know? The agent's blue eyes fixed on Jack's face. Whoever he was, he knew death was coming for him. The eyes went wide with pain one last time. The last breath hissed out, and the hands and the belly went limp. Ryan checked for a pulse at the neck. There was none. I'm sorry. Ryan reached down to close his victim's eyes. He was sorry. Hmm. Why? Tiny beads of sweat broke out all over his forehead, and nausea overpowered him. Romius had been hit in the upper leg. It was bleeding. Both his hands covered with blood were placed on the wound, but it didn't look that bad. Lieutenant Williams had been hit in the head and chest. He was still breathing, but unconscious. The head wound was only a crease. The chest wound close to the heart made a, a sucking noise. Kamarov was not so lucky. A single shot had gone straight to the top of his nose, and the back of his head was a bloody wreckage. Ryan found the intercom system. Which button? The captain held up two fingers. In control room, this is Ryan. I need help here. Your captain has been shot. 
the Ethan Allen. The only thing still operating was the timer. It had been set for 30 minutes, which had allowed the crew plenty of time to leave the area. The four bombs filled the Ethan Allen with the equivalent of 25 tons of TNT, evenly distributed throughout the hull. The results were catastrophic. The Ethan Allen burst as if it were a balloon, blasted into a dozen pieces, all bent into surreal shapes by the explosion. Everything fluttered downward to the hard sand bottom. The 15th day, Friday, 17 December. Ocracoke Inlet. There was no moon. The three-ship procession entered the inlet at five knots, just after midnight, to take advantage of the extra high spring tide. The pogie led the formation, since she had the shallowest draft, and the Dallas trailed the Red October. When they entered the sheltered waters, a Zodiac-type rubber boat zoomed toward them. Ahoy, Red October! A voice called in the darkness. May I answer, Captain Barodin? Ryan asked, getting a nod. This is Ryan. We have two casualties aboard. One's in bad shape. We need a doctor and a surgical team right away. Do you understand? Right. We'll have a doc flown down right away, October. Dallas and Pogey both have medical corpsmen aboard. You want them? Damn straight, Ryan replied at once. The Zodiac sped forward, reversed course, and disappeared in the darkness. The Dallas A half mile aft, Mancusa was using his portable radio to listen to the Zodiac. Do you read? This is Mancuso. When our friend stops, I want you to transfer ten men to her. They report two casualties who need medical attention, and make damn sure they're men who don't talk. Acknowledged, out. Mancuso watched the raft speed off to the pogey. You want to come along, Pat? You bet your ass. Yeah, but sir. You planning to go? Mannion asked. Mancuso was judicious. I think Chambers is up to handling Dallas for a day or so, don't you? Pamlico sound. The Zodiac approached the Red October slowly, almost wallowing with their cargo of men. Ahoy, Red October! This time Barodin answered. He had an accent, but his English was understandable. Identify! This is Bart Mancuso, commanding officer of the USS Dallas. I have our ship's medical representative aboard and some other men. Request permission to come aboard, sir. Ryan saw Barodin grimace. For the first time, he really had to face up to what was happening. Permission is... Yes, 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 Borodin nodded. The captain and a British officer, both shot. Shot? Mancusa was surprised. Worry about that later, Ryan said sharply. Let's get your doc working on them, okay? Sure. It was... Who are you, by the way? He is a spy, Borodin said with palpable irony. Jack Ryan. And you, sir? Captain, second rank, Vasily Borodin. I am the first officer, yes. Uh, come over into the station, Commander. Please excuse me, we are all, all of us, very tired. You're not the only ones, Mancuso said. Captain, I want you to know we had a bastard of a time tracking you. You ought to be complimented for your professional skill. The compliment did not elicit the anticipated response from Borodin. You were able to track us. How? I brought him along. You can, uh, you can meet him. And what are we to do? Orders from shore to wait for the dock to arrive and dive. And then we sit tight. Maybe a day, maybe two. I think we could all use some rest, huh? After that, we get you to a nice, safe place, and I will personally buy you the best damned Italian dinner you ever had. Mancuso grinned. You get Italian food in Russia? No. And if you are accustomed to good food, you might find Krasny October not your liking. Well, maybe I can fix that. How many men aboard? Uh, Twelve. Ten Soviet. The Englishman. And the spy. Borodin glanced with a thin smile. Okay. Mancuso reached into his coat and came out with a radio. This is Mancuso. We're here, Skipper, Chambers replied. Get some food together for our friends. Six meals for 25 men. Send a cook over with it. Wally, I want to show these men some good chow. You got it? Aye, aye, Skipper. 
out. Skipper, how long are we going to be here? Jones asked, settling into the October's sonar room. No, oh, a day or two. Why? Well, sir, this boat looks kind of you know, thin on creature comfort, you know? How about I grab a TV and a tape machine? Give him something to look at. You know, sort of sort of give him a, a quick look at the USA. Mancusa laughed. Okay, take one from the wardroom. Right, Skipper. Gradually, the officers were beginning to engage in conversation. Two Russians were trying to talk to Mannion and were looking at his hair. They had never met a black man before. Captain Barodin, I, uh, I have orders to take something out of the control room that comes from this boat, Mancuso pointed. Hey, can I take the depth gauge? I can have one of my men rig a substitute. The gauge he saw had a number. Well, for what reason? Well, beats me, but uh, those are my orders. Yes, Barodin replied. The White House. Pelt was on the phone to the Soviet embassy at three in the morning. Alex, this is Jeffrey Pelt. I'm informed that the USS Pigeon has rescued nearly the entire crew of another Soviet submarine off the Carolinas. Her name evidently was Red October. And that's the good news, Alex. The bad news is that the vessel exploded and sank before we could get them all off. Most of the officers and two of our officers were lost. Ah, and this submarine exploded. You are sure? Yeah. yeah. One of the crewmen said they had a major reactor accident. It was just good luck the pigeon was there. She was heading to the Virginia coast to look at another one you lost. I think your Navy needs a little work, Alex, Pelt observed. I will pass that along to Moscow, Doctor, Arbatov responded. Can you tell us where this happened? I can do better than that. We have a ship taking a deep diving research sub down to look for the wreckage. If you want, you can have your Navy fly a man to Norfolk, and we'll fly him out to check it for you. Fair enough? Indeed it is, Dr. Pelt. I must cable Moscow for instructions. I will be back to you. You are at your office? Correct. Bye, Alex. The Red October. Ryan woke up after six hours to the music of E.T. He arrived in the wardroom just in time to see the credits scrolling up the 13-inch TV set sitting on the end of the wardroom table. Most of the Russian officers and three Americans had been watching it. The Russians were all dabbing their eyes. Jack got a cup of coffee and sat at the end of the table. You liked it? It was magnificent, Barodin proclaimed. I'll have to write Jonesy another commendation letter. That was really a good idea, Mancuso said. The doctor came in. How's Williams? Ryan asked. Yeah. He'll make it. Noise filled his cup. And Captain Ramius? Barodin asked. No problem. He's still sleeping. Moscow. So, Comrade Admiral, you report success to us, Narmanov asked. Yes, Comrade General Secretary, Gorshkov nodded, surveying the conference table in the underground command center. Admiral Strobel's fleet intelligence officer, Captain Kaganovich, was permitted by the Americans to view the wreckage from aboard one of their deep submergence research vessels. The craft recovered a fragment of wreckage, a depth gauge dial. These objects are numbered, and the number was immediately relayed to Moscow. It was positively from Red October. Red October is dead. Our mission is accomplished. The 16th day, Saturday, 17 December. The Red October. The doctor allowed Ramius to walk the 15 feet from sickbay to the wardroom under supervision. Borodin and Mancuso assisted him into his seat at the head of the table. Ramius attacked his breakfast. After two days without a normal meal and all the blood loss from his leg wound, his body was screaming for food. Tell me, Ryan, Borodin was lighting a cigarette. What is it in America that we will find most amazing? Jack motioned to the captain's plate. Food stores. Food stores, Mancuso asked. Yes, yeah, supposedly the first thing that surprises people. People from your part of the world is going through a supermarket. Ah, well, tell me about them. Well, that's a building about the size of a football field. Well, maybe a little smaller than that. Well, you go in the front door and you get a shopping cart. Hey, the fresh fruits and the vegetables are on the right, and you gradually work your way left, 
through the other departments. I've been doing that since I was a kid. Ah, you say, fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, what about now, in the winter? In winter, Mancuso said. Huh. Maybe they cost a little more, but you can always get fresh produce. And meat? Ramius asked. Well, anything you want, Ryan answered. Beef, pork, lamb, turkey, chicken. The four Russians were doubtful. What else? Borodin asked. What else will surprise you? Well, say nearly uh, nearly everyone has a car. Most people own their own homes. If you have money, you can buy nearly anything you want. Ryan wondered how difficult it was for the Soviets. They had cast themselves away from everything they had known, trusting that what they found would be better. It was people like these who had built the American dream and people like these who were needed to maintain it. It was odd that such men should come from the Soviet Union. Or perhaps not so odd. The 17th day, Sunday, 19 December. The VK Konovalov. Tupolev was heading back west. The fleet order had instructed everyone but his Alpha and one other to return home at 20 knots. Tupolev would circle quietly and observe. The Red October. Captain, Jones called. You just got a ping from Pogi. The Pogi was now 10 miles ahead of the October and Dallas. The idea was that after she got ahead and listened for 10 minutes, a single ping from her active sonar would signal that the 10 miles to the Pogi and the 20 or so miles beyond her were clear. Jones was experimenting with the Russian sonar. The active gear he'd found was not too bad. The passive systems he didn't want to think about. The VK Konovalov. The Alpha drifted slowly at the edge of the continental shelf about 50 miles southeast of Norfolk. The Polev ordered the reactor chopped back to about 5% of total output, enough to operate the electrical systems and little else. His submarine was almost totally quiet. Orders were passed by word of mouth. Even ordinary cooking was forbidden. Cooking meant moving metal pots on metal grates, until further notice the crew was on a diet of cheese sandwiches. The Red October. Ryan checked his watch. It had been five hours already. A long time to sit in one chair. And from a quick glance at the chart, it appeared that the estimate of eight hours to Norfolk had been optimistic. Maybe it would take another four hours. It couldn't be too soon. Romulus and Mancuso looked pretty tired. Hmm. Everybody was tired. The VK Konovalov. Some noise to the south, the Meeman said. It is heading this way. Topolov went to the control room. He ordered power reduced in the reactor systems. He considered killing the plant entirely, but reactors took time to start up. There was no telling yet how distant the contact might be. One propeller, Comrade Captain. An American, probably a Los Angeles doing 35 knots. Bearing has changed only two degrees in 15 minutes. Oh, wait, wait. His engines have stopped. The 40-year-old warrant officer pressed the headphones against his ears. He has stopped to listen, comrade captain. Topolev smiled. Yeah, he will not hear us, comrade. Racing and stopping. Might he be escorting something? The Meeman listened to the headphones again and made some adjustments on his panel. Uh, perhaps there was a good deal of surface noise, comrade, and I... W uh, uh, wait, wait. There seems to be some noise, very faint. Uh, comrade Captain, a, a ping. A single ping on active sonar. So. The pole of leaned against the bulkhead. Good work, comrade, good work. Now we must be patient. The Red October. Can anybody spell me at the wheel? Ryan asked. Yeah, need a stretch? Mancuso asked, coming over. Ryan did some knee bends to get circulation back in his legs, then looked briefly at the chart. It seemed strange, almost sinister, to see the U.S. coast marked in Russian. Thank you, Commander. 
Sure. Mancuso stood. Captain, how uh, long to Norfolk? Oh, another four hours tops, Mancuso said. The idea is to arrive after dark. The VK Konovalov. Whatever it is, it is big, very big, I think. His course will take him within five kilometers of us. It sounds like a twin-screw submarine, Comrade Captain, the Meeman said. In any case, he will be with us in 20 minutes. Ten percent power, the Polar snapped. They cannot possibly hear that. The Pogi. Where did that come from? The sonar chief made some adjustments on his board. Con, sonar, I got a contact bearing 230. I think maybe we got us an alpha here. Oh, great. Signal Dallas right now. The chief tried, but the Dallas, running at 32 knots, missed the five rapid pings. Max power chief, hit Dallas with everything. Aye, aye. The chief flipped his power controls to full. It took several seconds until the system was ready to send a 100-kilowatt blast of energy. The Dallas. Wow, Chief Laval exclaimed. Con, sonar, danger signal from Pogi. All stop, Chambers ordered. Quiet ship. All stop, Lieutenant Goodman relayed the orders a second later. When speed gets to four knots, go to one-third speed, Chambers told the officer of the deck as he went aft to the sonar room. Frenchy, I need data in a hurry. It's still going too fast, sir, Laval said. The Pogi. Okay, sir. The Alice has killed power. Wood chewed on his lower lip. All right, now let's find the bastard. The sonar dome in the Pogi's bow blasted sound energy into the water. Fifteen seconds later, the first return signal appeared on Chief Palmer's screen. Con, sonar, we have a positive contact. Bearing 234, range 6,000 yards. Classify probable alpha class, Palmer said. Sonar, secure pinging. Wood said. Wood now had his target's position. Further pinging would only give it a better idea of his own. The boomer's still moving, sir, Chief Palmer reported. Skipper, Reynolds looked up from the paper tracks. Her course takes her between us and the target. Terrific. All ahead, one-third, left, 20 degrees rudder. Wood moved to the sonar room while his orders were carried out. Chief, power up and stand by to ping the boomer hard. Aye, aye, sir. Palmer worked his controls. Ready, sir. Hit it. Palmer punched the impulse control. The Red October. Skipper, Jones yelled. Danger signal. Mancuso jumped to the annunciator without waiting for Ramius to react. He twisted the dial to all stop. When this was done, he looked at Ramius. Sorry, sir. All right. Ramius scowled at the chart. Engine noises were diminishing. Mancuso took a few steps aft. Jonesy. Find what's out there. Aye, Skipper, but it won't be easy on this gear. He already had the sensor arrays working in the direction of the two escorting attack subs. Jones adjusted the fit of his headphones and started working on the amplifier controls. The Soviet systems had to be manipulated electromechanically, unlike the computer-controlled ones he was used to. Slowly and carefully, he altered the directional receptor gangs in the sonar dome forward. His right hand twirling a cigarette pack, his eyes shut tight. He didn't notice Bugayev sitting next to him, listening to the same input. The VK Konovalov. Tupolev winced. He had acted too soon. Now he had all three of them hovering nearby, almost still. The four submarines were moving only fast enough for depth control. The Russian Alpha was pointed southeast and all four were arrayed in a roughly trapezoidal fashion. The Pogi and the Dallas were to the north of the Konovalov. The Red October was to the southeast of her. The Red October. Somebody just pinged her, Jones said quietly. Bearing is roughly northwest, but she isn't making enough noise for us to read her. Sir, sir, if I had to make a bet, I'd say she was pretty close. Smart money, she's between us and our guys and a little west. I know it's shaky, sir, but it's the best we got. Range ten kilometers, perhaps less, Bugayev commented. Mancuso nodded and returned to control. Well, I know for sure it's not one of ours. Norfolk said this area was clear. That leaves one possibility. There's a hostile submarine out there. 
We drift? We drift, Romulus echoed, lifting the phone. He spoke a few orders. The Dallas. Let's move back south. I don't like the idea of having that Alpha closer to our friend than we are, Chambers said finally. The problem was that neither boat had authority to shoot. Both attack submarines were operating under the normal rules of engagement. They could fire in self-defense only and defend the Red October only by bluff and guile. The question was whether the Alpha knew what the Red October was. The Red October. They had been creeping along for a half hour now. Ryan was chain-smoking at his station, and his palms were sweating as he struggled to maintain his composure. He knew that there was a Soviet submarine out there, and he knew what her orders were. If her captain realized who they were, then... then what? The two captains, he thought, were amazingly cool. Can your submarines protect us? Romulus asked. What, shoot at a Russian sub? Hmm. Mancuso shook his head. What? Ryan was stunned. Well, you want to start a war? Mancuso smiled as though he found this situation amusing. You see, that's what happens when uh, warships from two countries start exchanging shots. Now we have to smart our way out of this. Yes, be calm, Ryan. This is our usual game. The hunter submarine tries to find us, and we try not to be found. I think we can move east slowly without being detected. We'll use the caterpillar. We'll move at six knots. Do you agree, Captain? Mancuso nodded. Hey, she's your boat, sir. The Red October was moving northeast at six knots now. The Kanavala was coming southeast at three. The Pogi was heading south at two, and the Dallas south at fifteen. All four submarines were now within a six-mile diameter circle, all converging on about the same point. The VK Konovalov Comrade Captain, I have a contact, but I do not know what it is, the Meeman said over the phone. Tupolev came back, munching on a sandwich. The Meeman handed the captain a spare set of phones. It may take a few minutes, comrade. It comes and goes. Tupolev sat down and listened patiently. It took five minutes for the signal to come back. Tupolev looked pale. He tossed the headphones on the table and went forward. He grabbed the political officer by the arm and led him quickly to the wardroom. It's Red October. Impossible! Fleet Command said that his destruction was confirmed by visual inspection of the wreckage. Now we have been tricked. The Caterpillar acoustical signature is unique, comrade. The Americans have him and he is out there. We must destroy him. No, we must contact Moscow and ask for instructions. Comrade Zampolit, it will take several minutes to approach the surface, perhaps 10 or 15 to get a message to Moscow. 30 more for Moscow to respond at all. By that time, Red October will be gone. There is no time to contact Moscow. But what if you're wrong? I am not wrong, comrades. Very well. The Zampolit seemed to deflate. The two men went back to the control room. The Konovalov kind of six bow torpedo tubes were loaded with Mark C-533 millimeter wire-guided torpedoes. All they needed was to be told where to go. Range 7,600 meters. Elevation angle zero, the Meeman reported. So this was the submarine they'd been sent to hunt, he thought. The chief fire control supervisor quickly entered the data into the computer. It was a simple problem of target geometry. We have a solution for torpedoes one and two. Prepare to fire. Flooding tubes. Our torpedo tube doors are open. Fire one and two, the Polev ordered. Firing one. Firing two. The Konovalov shuddered twice as compressed air charges ejected the electrically powered torpedoes. The Red October. Jones heard it first. High speed screws port side, he said. Torpedoes in the water, port side. Rule Nayeva, Ramius ordered automatically. What? Ryan asked. Left, left, rudder, left. Ramius pounded his fist on the rail. Left full, do it, Mancuso said. Left full eye. Ryan turned the wheel all the way and held it down. Jones, give me a bearing. Three, two, zero, sir. Two fish heading in, Jones responded at once. 
Steer 320. Ryan, Ramius ordered. Two fish heading in. Bearing is 320. I say again, bearing is constant. Jones reported much cooler than he felt. Now, here we go, guys. The two Mark C torpedoes were charging at 41 knots. A slow speed for this range, so they could be more easily guided by their sonar systems. They had a projected six-minute run with one minute already completed. Mancuso kept quiet now. Ramius was using a tactic that he didn't particularly agree with, turning into the fish. It offered a minimum target profile, but it gave them a simpler geometric intercept solution. Presumably, Ramius knew what Russian fish could do. Mancuso hoped so. Steady on 320, Captain, Ryan said, eyes locked on the gyro repeater. Ryan down. Maximum down on the diving planes. All the way down. Ryan was terrified. He had to assume that both commanders knew what they were about. There was no choice for him. Well, he thought he did know one thing. Guided torpedoes can be tricked, especially when the sub they're trying to locate is near the bottom or the surface areas where sonar pulses tend to be reflected. If the October dove, she could lose herself in an opaque field. Uh, presuming she got there fast enough. The VK Konovalov. Target aspect has changed, Comrade Captain. Target is now smaller, the Meeman said. Tupolev considered this. He knew everything there was on Soviet combat doctrine, and he knew that Ramius had written a good deal of it. Marco would do what he taught all of us to do, Tupolev thought. Turn into the oncoming weapons to minimize target cross-section and dive for the bottom to become lost in the confused echoes. Target will be attempting to dive into the bottom capture field. Be alert! Hey, comrade, can he reach the bottom quickly enough? The star palm asked. Tupolev racked his brain for the October's handling characteristics. No. No, he cannot dive that deep in so short a time. We have him. The Red October. Skipper, Jones called. Two fish bearing constant at 320. They just went active. I say again, the fish are now active. Ramius had been waiting for this. Bogayev? In the sonar room, Bogayev had powered up the acoustical jamming gear as soon as the fish were launched. Now he carefully timed his jamming pulses to coincide with those from the approaching torpedoes. The timing had to be precise. By sending out slightly distorted return echoes, he could create ghost targets. Not too many, not too far away, just a few close by, and he might be able to confuse the Alpha. He thumbed the trigger switch carefully, chewing on an American cigarette. The VK Konovalov. Damn, he's jamming us! The Meeman, noting a pair of new pips, showed his first trace of emotion. The fading pip from the true contact was now bordered with two new ones, one north and closer, the other south and farther away. Captain, the target is using Soviet jamming equipment. You see? The Polev said to the Zampolite. Use caution now, he ordered. The Red October. Ryan, all up on planes, Romulus shouted. All the way up. Ryan yanked back, pulling the yoke hard against his belly and hoping that Romulus knew what the hell he was doing. Jones moved the phones off one ear, his hand poised to slap the other off. The homing sonar on one torpedo was now tracking them. Bad news. If these were like Mark 48s, Jones knew all too well that those things didn't miss much. He heard the change in the Doppler shift of the propellers as they passed beneath the Red October. One missed, sir. Number one missed under us. Number two is heading in. Ping interval is shortening. The VK Konovalov. The second Mark C torpedo was cutting through the water at 41 knots. The first fish had been duped by the ghost images that the jamming had duplicated on the torpedo sonar frequency. The first one had missed low, he knew now. That meant that the target was the middle pip. Coolly and expertly, the star palm commanded the second torpedo to select the center target. It ran straight and true. The 500-pound warhead struck the target a glancing blow aft of the midships, just forward of the control room. It exploded a millisecond later. The Red October. The force of the explosion hurled Ryan from his chair, and his head hit the deck. He came to from a moment's unconsciousness with his ears ringing in the dark. The shock of the explosion had shorted out a dozen electrical switchboards, and it was several seconds before the red battle lights clicked on. Aft, Jones had flipped his headphones off just in time. 
But Bogayev, trying to the last second to spoof the incoming torpedo, had not. He was rolling in agony on the deck, one eardrum ruptured, totally deafened. Water was spraying into the radio room as though from a high-pressure hose, but the hull was otherwise secure. Ryan could hear water splashing into the next compartment forward. He didn't know what to do. Still with us? Mancuso's face looked satanic in the red lights. No, goddammit, I'm dead. What do I do? Romulus? Down. Dive for the bottom. Romulus took the phone and called engineering to order the engine stopped. Ryan pushed his controls forward. In a goddamn submarine that's got a goddamn hole punched in it, they tell you to go down, he thought. The VK Konovalov. A solid hit, Comrade Captain. His engine stopped. I hear hull creaking noises. His depth is changing. He tried some additional pings, but got nothing. The explosion had greatly disturbed the water. Trillions of bubbles had formed, creating an insonified zone around the target that rapidly obscured it. All he knew for sure was that one torpedo had hit, probably the second. He was an experienced man, and he had reconstructed most of the events correctly. The Dallas. Score one for the bad guys, the sonar chief said. The Dallas was running too fast to make proper use of her sonar, but the explosion was impossible to miss. The whole crew heard it through the hull. Con, sonar, the boomer took one hit. I don't hear her engines, but there ain't no breakup noises. I say again, sir, no breakup noises. Can you hear the alpha? No, sir. Too much crud in the water. We're going down. The disturbance from the explosion will stay fairly steady. If it moves at all, it'll go up. Okay, we'll go under it. First, we want to locate the boomer. If she isn't there, then she's on the bottom. It's only 900 feet here, so she could be on the bottom of the live crew. We've got to get between her and the Alpha. And he thought on. If the Alpha shoots then, I kill the fucker and the rules of engagement be damned. The Red October. The leak in the radio room was bad. But the radio room pump, supplemented by a master's own pump, was managing barely to keep up with the flooding. The radios were already destroyed, but no one was planning to send any messages. Ryan, all the way up and come right full rudder, Romulus said. Mancuso thought that they might just survive after all. In that case, he'd have to give this boat's plans a closer look. The VK Konovalov. Did we kill him? The Zampolit asked. Probably, Topolev answered, wondering if he had or not. We must close to be certain. Ahead slow. Ahead slow. Left ten degrees, rudder, Topolev ordered. We'll come around the dead zone to the north to see if he's still alive. Still nothing, the Meeman reported. No bottom impact, no collapse noises. N new contact. Bearing 170. Different sound, Comrade Captain. One propeller. Sounds like an American. What heading? South, I think. Yes. Yes, yes, south. The sound's changing. It is American. An American sub is decoying. Ugh. We ignore it. Ignore it, example, it said. Uh, they would not decoy if he was dead. Now we know that he's alive, but crippled, Tupolev said calmly. We will find him, and we will finish him. The Red October. Left rudder. Reverse course, Ramius ordered. What? Mancuso was astounded. Think, Mancuso, Ramius said. What has happened? Moskva ordered the hunter sub to remain behind. I know all their captains, all young, eh? all aggressive. Yes, eh? aggressive. He must know we are not dead. If he knows this, he will pursue us. So we go back like a fox and let him pass. Mancuso didn't like this. Ryan could tell without looking. We cannot shoot. Your men cannot shoot. We cannot run from him. He is faster. We cannot hide. His sonar is better. He will move east, use his speed to contain us and his sonar to locate us. By moving west, we have the best chance to escape. This he will not expect. Mancuso still didn't like it, but he had to admit it was clever. Too damned clever. He looked back down at the chart. It wasn't his boat. The VK Konovalov. 
contact, the Meeman said into the microphone. Ahead, almost dead ahead, using propellers and going at slow speed, bearing 044, range unknown. Is it red October? The Polev asked. I cannot say, comrade captain. It could be an American. It, well, he's coming this way, I think. Damn! The Polev looked around the control room. Could they have passed the red October? Might they already have killed him? The Dallas. Does he know we're here, Frenchy? Chambers asked back in sonar. No way, sir. Laval shook his head. We're directly behind him. Range of the Alpha? Under 3,000 yards, sir. All ahead two-thirds. Come left. Ten degrees, Chambers ordered. Frenchy, ping. But use the under ice sonar. He may not know what that is. Make him think we're the boomer. Aye, aye, sir. The VK Konovalov. High frequency pinging aft, the Meeman called out. Does not sound like an American sonar, comrade. Tupole was suddenly puzzled. Was it an American to seaward? The other one on his port quarter was certainly American. It had to be the October. Marco was still the fox. He had lain still, letting them go past so that he could shoot at them. All ahead full, left full rudder. The Red October. Contact, Jones sang out. Dead ahead. Wait. It's an Alpha. She's close. Seems to be turning. Somebody pinging her on the other side. Oh, Christ. Oh, she's real close. Captain, Mancuso said. The two commanders looked at one another and communicated a single thought as if by telepathy. Romulus nodded. Jonesy, ping the sucker. Mancuso ran aft. Jones loosed a single ranging ping. Range 1,500 yards. Zero elevation angle, sir. We're level with her. Okay, Jonesy, you're our fire control. Track the mother. The VK Konovalov. Captain, contact forward is not. Repeat, not Soviet. West and Northwest are both American. East target is unknown. Keep the rudder at full. Rudder is full, the helmsman responded, holding the wheel over. The target is behind us. We must lock on and shoot as we turn. Damn, we are going too fast. Slow to one-third speed. The Red October. Okay. The Alpha's continuing her turn. Now heading right to left, Jones said, watching the screen. His mind was working furiously, computing course, speed, and distance. Range is now 1,200 yards. She's still turning. If she's smart, she'll burn off south and get clear first. Then pray he ain't smart, Mancuso said from the passageway. Steady as she goes. Steady as she goes, Ryan said, wondering if the next torpedo would kill them. The Red October accelerated to 18 knots. The VK Konovalov. I have him, the Meeman said. Range, 1,000 meters. Bearing 045. Angle zero. Set it up. To Paul, I've ordered. It will have to be a zero angle shot. We're swinging too rapidly, the start bomb said. He set it up as quickly as he could. Ready for tube five only. Tube flooded, door open. Ready. Shoot. Fire five. The star bomb's fingers stabbed the button. The Red October. Range down to 900. High speed screws dead ahead. We have one torpedo in the water dead ahead. One fish heading right in. Forget it. Track the Alpha. The fish is closing rapidly, sir, Jones said. Screw it, track the Alpha. The combined speed ate up the distance between the submarines rapidly. The torpedo was closing the October faster still, but it had a safety device built in. To prevent them from blowing up their own launch platform, torpedoes could not arm until they were 500 to 1,000 yards from the boat that launched them. If the October closed the Alpha fast enough, she could not be hurt. The torpedo's close, sir. A few more seconds. Jones cringed, staring at the screen. The torpedo struck the Red October dead center in her hemispherical bow. The safety lock still had another hundred meters to run. The impact broke it into three pieces, which were batted aside by the accelerating missile submarine. The VK Konovalov. No explosion, Topolev wondered. Where is the target? Bearing 045, comrade. Bearing is constant, the Meeman replied. Closing rapidly. Topolev blanched. Left full rudder, all ahead, flank. The Red October. Turning. Turning left to right, Jones said. Bearing is now 230, spreading out a little. Need a little right rudder, sir. Ryan, come right, 10 degrees. Right 10 degrees, Ryan said. Range down to 400 yards, bearings 225 to the center of the target. Target spreading out left and right, mostly left, Jones said. Range 300 yards, elevation angle zero, we're level with the target. Range 250, 
Bearing 225 to target center. We can't miss, Skipper. We're going to hit, Mancuso called out. Brace for impact. Ramos yanked the collision alarm only seconds before impact. The Red October rammed the Konovalov just aft of midships at a 30-degree angle. The force of the collision ruptured the Konovalov's titanium pressure hull and crumpled the October's bow as if it were a beer can. Ryan was thrown forward and his face struck the instrument panel. The missile submarine bounded up and over the top of the Alpha, her keel grating across the upper deck of the smaller vessel as the momentum carried her forward and upward. The VK Konovalov. The last thing the Tupolev saw was a curtain of white foam coming from the starboard side. The Alpha rolled to port, turned by the friction of the October's keel. In a few seconds, the submarine was upside down. Throughout her length, men and gear tumbled about like dice. Half the crew were already drowning. The only marker on the Konovalov's grave was a mass of bubbles. The Red October. We still alive? Ryan's face was bleeding profusely. Up! Up on the plains! Romulus shouted. All the way up. Ryan pulled back with his left hand, holding his right over the cuts. Damage report, Ramius said in Russian. Reactor system is intact, Malekin answered at once. The damage control board shows flooding in the torpedo room, I think. I have vented high-pressure air into it, and the pump is activated. I recommend we surface to assess damage. Da. Ramius hobbled to the air manifold and blew all tanks. The 18th day, Monday, 20 December. The Red October. Ryan again found himself atop the sail thanks to Ramius, who said that he had earned it. In return for the favor, Jack had helped the captain up the ladder to the bridge station. Mancusa was with them. There was now an American crew below. Welcome home, Captain Ramius, Ryan said. Speaking for myself, sir, I'm, uh, I'm damned glad you're here. Tug approaching, Mancuso pointed. Twenty minutes later, they were at their destination. A huge concrete box, over 800 feet long, covered with a steel roof so that spy satellites could not see if they were occupied or not. All stop, Mancuso ordered. All stop, I. The diesel-powered tug took five minutes to line the bow up properly, headed directly into the water-filled box. Romulus gave the engine command himself, the last for this submarine. She eased forward through the black water, passing slowly under the wide roof. Mancuso ordered his men topside to handle the lines tossed them by the handful of sailors on the rim of the dock, and the submarine came to a halt exactly in its center. Already the gate they had passed through was closing, and a canvas cover was being drawn across it. Only when the cover was securely in place were the overhead lights switched on. Suddenly a group of thirty or so officers began screaming like fans at a ball game. The only thing left out was the band. Finished with the engines... Ramius said in Russian to the crew in the maneuvering room, and then switched to English with a trace of sadness in his voice. So, we are here. CIA headquarters. It was four in the morning when Ryan finally entered Greer's office. The Admiral was there, along with Moore and Ritter. The Admiral handed him something to drink. All three senior executives took his hand. Sit down, boy, Moore said. Damn well done, Greer smiled. Thank you. Ryan took a long pull on the drink. The sudden slug of whiskey made his eyes water, but he was able to refrain from coughing. Looks like that uh, uniform got some hard use, Ritter observed. So did the rest of me. Jack reached inside the jacket and pulled out the automatic pistol. This got some use, too. Greer took out a tape recorder and a yellow pad full of questions. Norfolk Naval Shipyard. The Red October sat alone with the dry dock draining around her, guarded by 20 armed marines. Already a select group of engineers and technicians was inspecting her. The first items taken off were her cipher books and machines. They would be in National Security Agency headquarters at Fort Meade before noon. Ramius, his officers, and their personal gear were taken to a CIA safe house in the rolling hills south of Charlottesville, Virginia. They went immediately to bed, except for two men who stayed awake watching cable television, already amazed at what they saw of life in the United States. Dulles International Airport. Ryan missed the dawn. He boarded a TWA 747 that left Dulles on time at 7.05 a.m. The sky was overcast, and when the aircraft burst through the cloud layer into sunlight, Ryan did something he had never done before. 
for the first time in his life. Jack Ryan fell asleep on an airplane. 